Doctors of Reddit, what happened when you diagnosed the COVID-19 denier with COVID-19? Ikunas here, 6 years, dealt with COVID since March 2020, actually had the first confirmed PT at our hospital, November February was rough. I had a 2 week streak where every day one or two of my patients would die, we'd go up to 3 or 4 patient assignments, the norm is 2, 1 or 1, 1 if on certain equipment, most all of the patients understood the severity of what they had, a handful didn't believe they had covered, even though removing high flow O2 or their BIPAP would put their sats down into the 60s or 70s, many had comorbidities that put them at risk, COPD asthma, obesity sleep apnea, smoking i think people would refuse to be intubated because they knew what the outcome would be fight hope pray fingers crossed whatever you want to call it delaying the inevitable our iq attending would actually have them sign consent for intubation if they were cognizant enough to do so almost all of them died very few made it out alive but still so sick and debilitated some with tratches one guy in particular sticks out this was right after christmas 21 years old HXDM1, obesity, sleep apnea, didn't like to take his insulin, admitted with COVID, didn't believe he had it, should have been tubed days before but refused, then he ended up being intubated emergently, took about 5 of us to prone him, lay him on his stomach, because his O2 sats were in the 60s, couldn't get a pulse, noticed no waveform on the art line, had to flip him back over to do CPR for about an hour or so before we called it, had a kid and a fiancé. Honestly, it was more of the families that denied their loved one had covered. Upset, understandably, about not being able to visit. Zoom calls just don't cut it. I say this all as my parents, mom SD and dad SM, are all covered deniers, even when I tell them what it's like. Well those people had other things wrong with them though. They were older they tell me. They send me links about all the conspiracy theories re covered. I got the Moderna in December and January, still haven't told them, it's awful, the facial swelling alone from being prone is enough to give a person nightmares, watching someone go into multi-system organ failure, needing dialysis, unable to put them back onto their back, being maxed out on ventilator settings and that still not being enough to the point of barotrauma and collapsing a lung and needing a chest tube to reinflate it, family is saying do everything even though they had coded once or twice. Hearing families on zoom crying, praying, singing as the patient is intubated, sedated, and paralyzed so the ventilator can do the work, tearing up under all the PPE because yeah, we are still human, we work so hard and sometimes it doesn't freaking matter, but we go back, day after day, I wish people who don't believe could see what I have seen, it might scare them enough to take precautions seriously and get the vaccine. I'm so sorry to hear you're going through this skepticism from families, and your own family, on top of everything else. Get some therapy if you can, it's so important for healthcare workers who've been through a trauma like this. Hugs if wanted. IQ covered IQ charge nurse here, had a woman try leaving the ear against medical advice with covered and was needing tons of O2. Our docs convinced her to get admitted. My wife was her a nurse and brought her up to me, patient was yelling and screaming ripping off her mask, spitting and telling us we're all sheep between gasping for breath. Our docs told her she was close to needing to be intubated, breathing tube, and she just scoffed. We reached out to the husband who proceeded to swear and berate us, telling us we're keeping her prisoner, no visitors in our covered unit, and that we can do whatever we need because none of this is real and it's all for show so you guys can get paid. She gets intubated decompensates over the next few days, and finally codes. We code, perform CPR, give medications, defibrillate, etc. Her for well over 1.5 hours before calling her time of death. The kicker was calling her husband and getting absolutely excoriated because we injected her with COVID as an experiment and killed her. He then had to be escorted out of the hospital when he came in to try getting up to the unit. Without a mask, of course. This crap's getting exhausting. One story stands out. Last summer a guy came to the ED with symptoms and tested positive. He refused admission for the classic list of reasons. It's a complete hoax. And even if it's not a complete hoax it's not that big a deal. I'm strong enough. Etc. Couple days later he was back in the ED with his mom. Who he lived with and who was now also symptomatic. 
They were both admitted and eventually put on ventilators. Guy lived, but his mom didn't. Dude killed his mom. I can't imagine how you live with that. Nurse here. I had covered and now I am in rehabilitation because my lungs are at 70% capacity. Now. I was at 40% capacity and now when I hear someone say that. I have the urge to slap them with a chair. I will need another year until I am fully recovered. Not a doctor. But my cousin-in-law was a covid denier. Went to his covid denier girlfriend's family house for thanksgiving without telling his parents that they were covid deniers. He was living with his parents, my wife's aunt and uncle, since he had recently divorced his wife. Got back and found out a week later that the whole girlfriend's family tested positive. He got it, so his parents both got it. His mother was in treatment for breast cancer and his dad had asthma BTW and they are not covid deniers. His mother recovered, but his dad, my wife's uncle, went from coughing and wheezing the day after Christmas to the on New Year's Day. Within 24 hours after that he was put on a ventilator. Three weeks later he passed. So yeah, my covid denier cousin-in-law effectively killed my wife's uncle and now that whole part of the family is really tense as his brothers kinda blame him for killing their dad but their mom. Wife's aunt isn't willing to blame her son. Frick covid deniers. It's not really a joke. These buttholes are literally killing people through gross negligence and idiocy. My mother killed my aunt, her own sister, who was at risk, just to prove a point about covid supposedly being a hoax. It's the second relative that my mother killed. Now, mom thinks very highly of herself. She is very religious and believes she belongs in heaven and that I am a heathen for being gay. Sure, I love someone of the same sex as me, but at least I didn't kill two people. As an anesthesiologist, by the time someone's calling for us it's for intubation and the patient is in no condition to deny anything. Honestly, it's usually the family that's the issue and that needs to be escorted from the room. My mom works for an OBGYN who specializes in high risk pregnancies and births, and he was called into the hospital to check out a woman whose due date was about 2 weeks away and who was very sick. He confirmed she had covered and admitted her to the hospital until she gave birth, but she insisted it was a hoax and ended up checking herself out AMA, but not before she spat in the face of the nurse, who coincidentally had just completed chemo, that was near the beginning of the pandemic. And I'm so curious what happened to that lady. The nurse is okay, thank goodness. That is at least assault, but possibly so much more depending on the outcome. I'm a student, funeral director and I see families go to the funeral of someone who died of COVID-19 and still deny it. They started out shrieking at the doctors to change the cause of death on the death certificate. Now FEMA is helping with funeral expenses for COVID deaths. Suddenly there's changes of heart. They just kept denying they had it, stated they had something else, and tried to leave against medical advice while on high flow nasal cannula which we didn't let him do because he would have died within minutes. Before he was admitted to the hospital, he was symptomatic but refused to isolate at home. He gave it to his wife who ended up in the IQ. I'm a doctor working in acute internal medicine. I've seen lots of COVID over the last 12 months. Probably 300 plus cases. The one that sticks out in my mind the most was a 70 year old lady with COPD. She refused to have a vaccine because she didn't trust it despite the fact she was eligible for one 4 weeks beforehand. In the UK, subsequently caught COVID and was admitted to hospital. She repeatedly doubted this was the diagnosis. She refused to go to our COVID high dependency unit despite quite significant respiratory failure. Of course she deteriorated over a number of days to the point where she was on maximal oxygen on the ward and at that point finally accepted treatment in HDU with high flow oxygen. Although continued to doubt she had COVID. Died within 24 hours of her HDU admission having refused to go to IQ. And of course, what did her family say? They were convinced she never had COVID and even went as far as accusing us of withholding life-saving treatment from her. Unfortunately there's no treatment for stupidity. I work with a denier with COPD. Mid 60s. No masks. Refuse the injection etc. It blows my mind that she hasn't caught it. The worst thing is we have two immunocompromised people on the same floor as her. My wife's a nurse, 
just had to deal with a patient who refused to get tested prior to her surgery so they had to treat her like a covid patient and needed to charge her for all the added ppe like gowns goggles etc the kicker is recovery wouldn't take her for observation while she was woken up so the anesthesiologist needed to stay and monitor her in the room for nearly three hours they are billed at 400 dollars 15 minutes and there is no way her insurance is going to cover the extra cost because she signed a document saying she denied a covered test four thousand eight hundred dollars extra for the anesthesiologist didn't diagnose a denier so not exactly this but did have a patient refuse testing upon admission and aggressively yelling covered is a hoax. I calmly said okay, nurse, since we won't know his status, please admit him to the covered floor. He became a believer in an instant and requested to be tested. So basically he never really doubted the virus and just thought his own risk of catching it was low, and frick everyone else. Not a doctor, but one of my university friends is a nurse in a covered ward and has been since April 2020. She said she's lost count of how many people she's seen die while still denying covid is real, or their families freak out at the healthcare workers and claim they are setting this up for the media. Super bizarre. One woman tested positive but had mild symptoms. Because of her age and some other health issues, they wanted to put her on oxygen early as a precautionary measure. She refused and went home. She came back and less than 24 hours later super sick and unable to breathe. She said somebody must have injected her with chemicals from a Wuhan lab while she was at the hospital the day prior. But then she also said it was fake. Not sure how that works out. Anyway, she kept carrying on about how God was just allowing Satan to test her faith and she would remain in the hospital but not allow treatment. She allowed a saline IV and then removed it and claimed it was full of vaccine tests to eradicate white people. Then she demanded her family be allowed into the hospital and covered ward without a mask. This carried on as she got sicker and sicker over about 48 hours before she slipped out of consciousness. The last word she said to my friend were you'll burn in heck for your part in this. She also had a story about a guy who had covered twice and was in the hospital for over 3 months during 2021. When the time period had passed since his second battle, she recommended he get the vaccine since he was clearly very susceptible to it. Keep in mind the first time he had it it was mild, so he was still going around everywhere to bars and out to eat. Places never closed here, it's super conservative without a mask who knows how many people he passed it to anyway his reply to her suggestion was now why the frick would i want to let those goddamn chinese track me like that i won't get something that isn't real b you almost died it would be so so hard to resist telling the lady that god gave you covered as punishment for not following his commandments as a retort what a piece of work my worst experience was when a two-year-old kid got diagnosed with covid his mother had brought him with care of fever and diarrhea. The child was severely dehydrated and so we had to do a mandatory swab test since we planned to admit him. It came positive and the mother refused to admit it. We were ready to perform a repeat test and we even advised for the parents to get tested. Her defense was the child never left the house. It's just I and the father who go to work daily. The grandmother babysits while we are away. How can he even get covered without leaving the house? She had called her husband. He came with 10-15 relatives in a car. They broke a few chairs and then left with the baby. We just informed about the case to the COVID control center. Not a doctor, but nurse that worked in one of our COVID IQs. Lady was intubated, sedated, prone. Therapy that involves lying the patient on their stomach in order to oxygenate the lung more effectively. Reserved for very sick COVID patients. The whole shebang. Miraculously she recovers and is weaned down to high flow nasal cannula. Still a fairly high oxygen requirement, but better than needing the breathing tube. This spiteful she devil would purposely cough on us nurses as we went into her room to give meds care. Simultaneously yelling that covid isn't real, and that we gave her covid goddess winter sucked. Not a doctor but when my grandmother was dying, my relatives kept pushing me and the doctors to say what it really was. It added so much stress to an already difficult situation and was embarrassing as well. Even after she died, they kept saying things like, what if it was a stroke and she was misdiagnosed? Don't you think they just didn't want to help her? I was trying to arrange with hospice to go in and say goodbye and my stupid second cousin was sending me YouTube videos about how COVID is fake. 
I was already not close with these people and I am glad they are out of my life now. I'm a family doc who mostly does outpatient. I live in a pretty conservative area with a good proportion of COVID deniers. So I've been seeing COVID deniers since this mess became politicized. I've lost a few patients over the mask mandate. Anyway, I'm pretty pleased to say that several of my COVID denying patients have completely turned their attitude around when they, or a close family member, contracted COVID. Even if their case wasn't severe, the sudden terror that they could wind up on a ventilator overnight really puts the fear of God into people. Unfortunately, I still have some patients who are still pretty obnoxious despite their COVID diagnosis. They mostly dig in deeper into paranoia, if not about the virus itself, then about the circumstances surrounding them contracting it. If OC had done his job from the beginning, it never would have hit us town. It's the entire fault of Obamacare that I can't get the experimental immunoglobulin treatment. It's not. Your eligibility for the infusion is dependent on a list of risk factors. And, probably my favorite. So I have COVID and it's completely your responsibility to fix it. I need you to send hydroxychloroquine, zinc, vit D, lisinopril and azithromycin to the pharmacy. Then they proceed to get pee at me when I don't. And yes. Each of those things were actual things patients said to me after getting their diagnosis. I could probably think of more, but those were the most memorable ones. Family members have come in with a sick family member and lied about exposure and or symptoms. Despite a member, S, testing positive, this can has led to inappropriate management, delay in treatment, and exposure of staff and other families. The family members then get angry when told to isolate. Reading some of these stories are wild even at the brink of death people still refuse that COVID is real or that they have it. They would rather believe anything else almost to a point that I feel a doctor could tell them they are dying of AIDS or some made up disease and they go oh see I knew it wasn't COVID. Not a doctor but my wife is and a few of our family friends are as well. One of them is sports medicine family. The guy came and refused to use a mask. Our friend refused to treat him until he masked up. He had a newborn at the time too. When our friend told him he most likely has COVID he needs to go to Tampa General immediately for testing and treatment. The guy said no, it's fake he just needed some antibiotics. He left without getting a prescription called back that night demanded to be given oxygen. Our friend told him his only option was to go to the hospital. Guy had a severe case of COVID and ended up being hospitalized for a few weeks he still thinks it was fake and was only a severe flu. Still had to treat her despite her accusing me of hiding the real diagnosis from her and doing something to make her sicker. Love my job. I can't fathom that people really believe that in a pandemic their likelihood of having COVID is so low that they accuse people of hiding a diagnosis. Makes no sense to me. I'm an attending physician at our Tridge unit. On a Friday, an older gentleman, 60 and years came in with his entire family, wife, sister, Bill, two newfs and three children, none of them with a FASC mask, all had mild COVID symptoms except him, he was saturating 80% with evident shortness of breath. We insisted in doing PCR and a chest cat scan looking for COVID but he and his wife refused saying that COVID wasn't real and it was just a bacterial infection the more we talked with him the more agitated he got to the point that his face was red. We suggested hospitalizing him to stabilize him and start treatment, but they accused us of exaggerating his symptoms and that we only wanted to hospitalize him so we could steal the liquid in his knees. A stupid rumor that was going around when this whole thing started. They both cursed at us and said they were going to a better hospital to get antibiotics. Fast forward 24 hours later on Saturday, we get a call from the hospital next county over telling us that they intubated one of our patients because he went into respiratory failure when he arrived and they had to transfer him here because they don't have the appropriate equipment. We transfer the patient on Sunday only to find out on the CAT scan he had 90% of lung damage. He passed away on Monday morning. Just before the family took the body away, I gave the widow the death certificate that I filled out. And before walking away, she turns around and waves the certificate yelling see, I told you it wasn't covered. It says here, death due to pulmonary pneumonia due to SARS-CoV-2. I knew it was a bacteria. I told her, SARS-CoV-2 is COVID-19, mom. It's difficult to argue with a genius but it's impossible to argue with an idiot. I'm an anesthesiologist, and in our institution, 
We're the ones tasked with intubating COVID suspects positive patients who would otherwise die without ventilatory support. And holy heck, there are a lot of patients who don't believe COVID is real most of them believe that it's just an elaborate lie that doctors use to label random patients to mooch money off them. Some of them scream at us. In whatever capacity their diseased lungs can allow them to, some outright refuse intubation, in which case they die several hours later from respiratory failure. It's emotionally taxing having to face that every shift. I'm an emergency depth physician in the US. I work in an area that had the highest death rate for a solid couple weeks in the country. During our peak time when we had national news crews here covering how we were a shit show. Saw numerous people screaming their COVID disease wasn't real despite being hypoxic and on large amounts of oxygen due to COVID. That was an unpleasant time as this was still early, May June, and it was extremely political like people apparently plotting to kidnap our state governor due to lockdowns. Saw a lot of people refusing COVID testing who needed admission for non-COVID purposes because the swabs would give them COVID or put some sort of tracking device. They weren't pleased when they then had to be admitted to our full-blown COVID floors. Our COVID floors resembled a war zone because they were understaffed and relative crap hole conditions as we basically converted hallways into COVID floors. Also saw a lot of people young people who weren't exactly deniers but thought you basically couldn't sick if you were young. Lots of people with their lungs permanently scarred or at a minimum a couple weeks of misery and or spread it to their loved ones who got extremely ill. That last point. I am early 40s. I wonder how many people my age will be dying early in 20-30 years from the long term damage that a mild case of COVID did to their lungs and or body. RN here with most of 2020 spent in COVID land. I never had anyone refuse treatment when things got serious. I know some of the MDs I worked with got yelled at, like the rest of us. But honestly that happens frequently anyway. Some denial patients lived, many of which had accepted reality by the end of their stay after seeing what we all were going through to treat them. Some died telling me I was a sheep or an idiot or a liar between gusps of air. Covid didn't care. Imagine your last words are calling the guy trying to save your life a liar. I work on a covered unit and I ran into a patient like this. They'd tell me over and over again about how they weren't really sick and about how I didn't need to be gowned up in PPE. They even tried to take my face shield off. If you test positive for COVID two times then you have COVID. People are crazy. Comma they even tried to take my face shield off. That is beyond crazy emo. Be nuts all to yourself. Don't freaking touch others you psycho. I had a lady who was maxed out on high flow. Next step is breathing tube. Who still refused she had COVID and was holding a negative test in her hand that she had taken a week prior. The covered equivalent of the Black Knight from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. I'm an ODP and work alongside anesthetists in theaters and IQ. To be honest I've not really seen anything from patients regarding outright denial. However, I have seen some of my friends on Facebook who have spouted all sorts of lies. That's really disappointing to say the least. One of them, a friend of my wife, works at the hospital. She works in admin and refuses to wear a mask and even bought some certificate off the net so she doesn't have to wear one in public. Anyway that's being escalated up the chain of disciplinary action. If you have such a bad respiratory issue that you can't wear a mask then maybe you should stay home. I swear these people pee me off so bad. I hope she gets appropriate punishment for her refusal. I have treated a young male in our IQ with critical COVID-19 with severe diabetic ketoacidosis. He did not believe in insulin, yes, you are reading this right, or other anti-diabetics, even though insulin is inexpensive in our country. He tried to treat his type 2 diabetes with herbs, his HbA1c, the lab value showing the state of his diabetes on the longer run, was off the roof. He did not vaccinate, he was offered, did not wear a mask, did not distance, and did not believe in any of this corona bullshit. Most of this information was obtained from his 20 year old daughter, as he was quite disoriented at presentation and was intubated urgently. She was sobbing through the phone every day for 1.5 months until he died. I held the phone with his daughter on call to his ears multiple times when he was still intubated but his mind cleared up and his sedation was optimal. I was quite convinced that he realized his mistake on the ventilator, with lines and tubes inserted into his body everywhere and in his last clear moments. When his mind allowed, 
but I cannot be absolutely sure. I often think about the last conversation and last mental images people have before their death. Not a doctor but work in the psych area of the emergency department. Needless to say there's a lot of psychiatric illness based COVID denial and or paranoia. Patients often refuse swabs thinking we are trying to implant microchips. I only bring up my experience to contrast my psychiatrically unwell COVID denying patients to the psychologically unfit COVID denying population. One is because of brain chemical imbalances and the other due to propaganda, politicization, and poor critical thinking skills. It's interesting that the outcomes are similar, if only in this respect. Doctors and nurses of Reddit. What was the craziest example of someone stupidly making their condition worse? Had a patient come in and had accidentally stuck a chainsaw in his leg the day before. He managed to cut the fibula I think and partially cut the tibia. He put some diesel on it and wrapped it in duct tape and kept working. The next day he steps off something and it snaps the rest of the way through. Came in the front door with his leg flopping bending where it shouldn't be. And to top it off he rated his pain at 6 stroke 10. Tough old man. We admitted him to ortho to clean out the diesel and necrotic flesh. The 6 stroke 10 part made me laugh honestly. I can't decide whether to believe him or not. Surgical nurse here. Had a patient return to the OR who had some hardware, plates and screws, put in their elbow for a fracture. The hardware was causing them discomfort so instead of talking to her surgeon they decided to try and remove one of the sews with a knife and screwdriver. I got the case for the wound cleanup and replacement of said exposed screw. One of the strangest ones I've had yet. I saw this young guy in the air once who had gotten into a drunken brawl with some guys at a bar. When he woke up the next morning, he started getting some vision changes. He said that it was like a black sheet coming down on his left eye. This is a textbook symptom for retinal detachment. Picture an incredibly thin, delicate membrane on the back of the eye, slowly peeling off because of trauma. It's an emergency in ophthalmology because if it fully detaches, you get permanent vision loss. You basically need to immediately go for surgical repair, and then be extremely careful with that eye for weeks afterward. You even have to keep your head down most of the time for the next couple days to help the reattachment process take. So, naturally this guy goes and rides roller coasters all day at the local theme park with his buddies. He first presented to Ara two days later with permanent vision loss in that eye. Six flags was not worth it, poor guy. They should stamp no carnival rides in indelible ink on such a patient's forehead. It should last as long as need be. Male patient was in for dehydration and other very routine issues. He had an indwelling catheter placed. Now an odd thing about some men is that they cannot wrap their minds around not standing up to pee. So even though he couldn't feel any urge to urinate he stood up to pee. Felt the catheter, forgot why it was there, and promptly ripped it out. Now he's incontinent. Another patient was in recovering from surgery. I think it was knee ankle. Something that required she use a walker while recovering. She decided not to do that and test her leg she fell onto the tile floor and broke her hip. My wife, nurse, has seen on more than one occasion. A person on oxygen for emphysema blow themselves up with a cigarette. She said, sometimes it's funny, like Wally Coyote funny, and they're not injured. But sometimes the injuries are quite severe. My 84 year old grandma did this last fall. I thank god and every other power that she was mostly fine. First degree and mild second degree burns. Especially in and around her nostrils. And some bad memories to have nightmares about. Complete with a big black burn on the hardwood floor to remind her. Had a patient with stage 0 breast cancer. Decided not to get the lump taken out and instead pursue traditional Chinese medicine. Came back a couple years later with metastatic breast cancer everywhere. Another patient treated her breast cancer with coffee enemas. Spoiler alert it didn't work. A woman who I was taking care of in labor was having heartburn. And she was sucking on a quickies to get rid of it. However, she was also sucking on the gas and air at the same time for pain relief. And she sucked so hard that she choked on the cookies and we had to call a code blue because she couldn't cough it back up. We eventually sorted her out and she was okay and went back to laboring. She did literally exactly the same thing 10 minutes later. Had to call a code again. This was one of the times I really wanted to be able to tell a person that they couldn't take their baby home because they were too stupid to be allowed to have children. 
I was a nurse for 20 years, but this is a story about my husband. The man has a very high pain tolerance and is always hungry, so one day when I met him for lunch I was worried when he wouldn't eat and said his lower abdomen hurt. I talked to a doctor friend and husband was sent for an immediate CT scan. Husband was sent home to wait for the results. So, being him, felt better and ate two chili dogs with fritters. Of course when the doc called and told him to get to the hospital now because his appendix was about to rupture. Husband had to be kept in a holding pattern for 12 hours because he'd eaten a big meal. I may have shouted at husband a little bit that day. I am in awe. I've seen my cousin screaming for mercy and or quick painless death. When his appendix got infected. Shouting was well deserved. I have a patient with autism whose mum tells him she can heal him with crystals and he has a demon inside him. Whenever she tries to visit him it's messed him up so much he makes himself vomit so she leaves. It's super effective. Also patients who let their dogs lick wounds leg ulcers because they think it'll make it heal quicker. It does not. I used to work at an oral surgeon's office. A patient came in needing a tooth pulled and BC the root was near the jaw they needed to remove it under anesthesia. The patient did not want to pay for the anesthesia, $350, so he decided to try and take it out on his own. He used plaster ended up breaking his jaw. We had to go and fix his jaw and wire his mouth shut. Ended up costing him $9000 instead of $500. Doctors have to treat you of you don't have money. Dentists don't. Teeth are apparently not part of your body. Obligatory not a doctor. I'm an optician and optometrist and so many semi-blind people refuse to get glasses because they don't want to spoil their eyes. They come back 6 months later with migraines and complain about not being able to drive in the dark or read. And get angry because their eyesight is not getting better although they're always training their eyes. It doesn't work like that. Nurse here. The condition was not worsened by the patient himself, but his choice of life partner certainly did not help. A patient was utterly ravaged by advanced cancer. Several doctors have told him and his wife that his condition is terminal. Patient seemed to understand when he was lucid. Wife said she understood as well. He was in hospice for comfort. One night he had trouble breathing, as the dying tend to do. Wife called 911 against patient's wishes. Thus began a three week pointless and painful painful ordeal that involved life support, dialysis, at least one round of CPR, on a man whose bones were riddled with metastasis, and diarrhea. Wife was adamant that he will get better through holistic medicine. On top of being a denial, she was dumber than dirt she filled the intensive care room with all sorts of new age chocks like inspirational pictures and rocks. She even refused pain medicine because it would, like, dim his chakras. Wife left a crystal geode on the bed. Crystal worked its way underneath patient's hip. Patient developed a raging bed sore that never closed, was nearly always soaked in fesses and was a beta dress, on a patient who wanted to die and was in already excruciating pain. This was years ago. Still, I can honestly say I hate that woman. The healing crystal pressure saw through me over the edge. Poor guy. Patient here. I got an itch in my eye one night and figured my contact had dried out. I went to remove it but the dang thing was stuck on my eye. So I started pinching. Hard. Trying to get it off. And then my vision went all wacky and my eye started to really hurt. Gave up and went to the air cause I couldn't see. Turns out my contact had fallen out before the whole process started and I'd been scratching the crap out of my eyeball. Had to wear an eye patch and put in some very unpleasant drops for a week or two. Oops. I had a client with a stroke, who received TENS treatment in rehabilitation. Really low electric impulse to stimulate muscles and nerves. After rehabilitation he was offered to get one of the things for home use. Completely free of charge costs. He refuses because filling out the paper, one page, was too much work. He decided to just use what he had at home and tried using a transformator transistor for this therapy. That completely destroyed the small amount of nerval function we had archived in rehabilitation and screwed up his condition a lot. Do not try this. This hurts. A lot. When I was on medicine wards in med school we had a patient with a Zincus diverticulum. It's essentially a weak spot as his esophagus kinda makes an out pouching where food and liquid get stuck. He can then regurgitate the food and aspirate leading to pneumonia and other bad stuff. We were the primary team and Serg was going to take him back to the ore on Friday. 
Thursday night he eloped and no one knew where he went. He came back Monday to the ED and got readmitted. When we asked where he went he said there was a big food festival that weekend that he didn't want to miss. So he went. Instead of getting the surgery he needed he left to go eat fatty and thick fried foods which literally could have killed him. My mom's current BF has oral and throat cancer. Guy literally has a stoma and no tongue. Was still smoking around 3 packs a day until recently. Mill got diagnosed W stage 3 lung cancer quit smoking and drinking for a couple of months. As soon as doctor said her condition was improving she went straight back to smoking and partying. Only took a few months for the cancer to get to stage 4 and spread to her liver, kidneys, and brain. She smoked up until a couple days before she died and even then only because the brain cancer caused her to lose control of her limbs and she physically couldn't hold a cigarette anymore. It was so sad to watch. I'm incredibly proud of my husband though. He quit smoking with her to help support her and never started again even after she did. Said he never wants our girls to have to go through that with him. Not a doctor, but I had a stress fracture in my foot that had to be surgically corrected. I was given a 60 day supply of Vicodin, but my now ex-husband was a recovering alcoholic who had me convinced that I was going to become horribly addicted if I took them for more than a couple days. So I began taking a leave because it was stronger than Tylenol and I only had to take one a day. My foot was very slow to heal, like a couple months go by instead of the usual 6 weeks. I had to get a CT scan. And I was very worried because this small little fracture just wasn't healing. My doctor asked what I was doing for pain. And I told him about the Aleve. Turns out NSAIDs interfere with bone healing. I cut out the Aleve. And my foot healed a few weeks later. Your ex obviously produced a peer reviewed study researching. Ha 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 ha. Work comp adjuster here. Had a claim and completely disappear after a surgery was ordered. Fast forward 2 years and he gets an attorney who demands the surgery be approved now. After months of back and forth we approve the wrist surgery. 2 days post op the police find him walking down a county road. Blasted out of his mind on M. Ripping out his stitches. Apparently he went on a rim binge and just tore apart his surgical site. Doctor dropped him, his attorney dropped him, the state basically closed his case. The last I heard was he got out of jail. Grabbed all his meds from home and disappeared again. But never followed up with the doctor. I cringe to think what his arm looks like. MD. Here. Had a patient who was found unconscious and taken to our hospital. Turns out he was diabetic. Unbeknownst to him. And went into a coma. We got him straightened out and sent him home with insulin. Fast forward a week or two and he comes into the for vomiting. Dehydration and blurred vision. He hadn't been taking his insulin since only really sick people need insulin. Well, he's technically right. We see a lot of people who get a common rash like eczema or some other and specify dermatitis who very sadly convince themselves that they have bugs or worms or other creatures in their skin. They dig at their skin, pour bleach on themselves several times a day, or even cut themselves into the skin to try to dig these non-existent parasites out. In doing so, they hurt, sting itch and suffer more so isolate themselves from family and friends fearing they'll spread a non-existent infestation it's sad not a doctor but my sister and i go christmas shopping she's newly pregnant i can tell she's in pain and it's getting worse she claims it's just gas she thinks all stomach pain is gas i offer to take both carts to check out while she sits for a bit at this point she's vomiting I'm pretty worried and tell her I think we need to go to the hospital. She insisted it was gas and she had a doctor's appointment the next day so she'd mention it. Next day, she has ultrasound before OB appointment. 5 minutes and she calls me and says she doesn't know what's happening but they told her to get dressed and not to move. She hears them call an ambulance. Ruptured ectopic pregnancy with internal bleeding. She's fine though. Ended up pregnant again 2 months later with my nephew. But she still doesn't learn. After weeks of her sick and looking like death I convinced her to go to her doctor last week. She has pneumonia. She was probably in denial about losing her baby. Glad she got pregnant again but I'm sure she still feels that loss. But also she does just sound kind of stupid about her own health. You don't just miss pneumonia. Homeless man came in the air with a small cut on his scalp. Doc stitched it up but he went back to sleeping in the gutter. Never came back for his checkup a week later. 
Six months later he showed up with an entire colony of maggots living under his scalp. No woo Oncology nurse here, had a patient with a relatively treatable cancer fail to tell us about an herbal cure that his son bought for $300 a bottle. He was taking it while getting chemotherapy. He wound up basically shutting down his liver and kidneys, hospitalized 4 weeks and delaying treatment. So yay, the cancer spread, system 2 weakened to resume treatment, he's dead, and all because of the snake oil cure. Sad that families spend hundreds to thousands of dollars out of desperation, and wind up causing more harm death. But holes that promote these cures for profit need to be sued. Not stupid, but just plain confused. Grandpa admitted for pelvic distension, pyelonephritis and UT secondary to urinary retention. Urologist places a Foley catheter in to relieve his bladder and drains 3 gallons of urine in one sitting. Grandpa gets a good day's rest and all goes well until one night we find him standing butt naked in the middle of his room with his penis oozing a pool of blood at his feet and the catheter, with a balloon still inflated, clutched in his fist. He had a very calm what are you all looking at expression as we reacted in horror. His nurse quickly calls the urologist again and he places another Foley catheter with orders for continuous irrigation and to transfuse a unit of blood. Kept him longer in the hospital than he really needed to be. Nope. Stop. My penis is now a raisin. I'm an animal nurse, vet tech, and had a chihuahua come in that had been limping. The owners had been giving him ibuprofen inside of pieces of chocolate. It was certainly a self-inflicted condition. Old guy in for rehab after some kind of orthopedic surgery, taking warfarin for DVT prophylaxis. His INR, a clotting time test basically, was coming back out of whack time after time despite dose adjustments and nobody could really figure it out. Went in his room on some routine task and saw a large pill bottle on the dresser. Turned out to be an herbal supplement containing, among other things, garlic, ginger, and if I recall correctly ginseng. All of which interact with warfarin to make it more effective. Guy's wife took pills home. Guy lectured on please run even OTC meds past your doctor cause you absolutely did this to yourself. Labs normalized. Jeez, I have to stay away from herbal teas because of warfarin. What an idiot. Contact lens wearers please do yourself a favor and take out your contacts when you're told to. I had a patient who came in and she thought she scratched her eye taking her contact out. When we looked, she had a gigantic ulcer on her eye. Yes. Like a canker sore that you get on your mouth can be on your eye. Ulcers, if deep enough, will eventually scar. Depending on where the ulcer develops, will determine if there is any long term damage done. I would say if the ulcer was about 0.5 mm to the left, the patient would have lost some of her central vision. She already had 5 ulcer scars in that eye and 8 ulcer scars in the other. This was not her first rodeo. Turns out, she sleeps in her contacts every night and throws them out about once every 3 months to save money. A year supply of her monthly contacts was $120. That one office visit alone was about $100 plus about $200 for a tiny bottle of medication to treat the ulcer. Not to mention a copay for her follow up visits. Of course, she has no backup glasses and obviously can't wear the contacts with an ulcer so she also had to pay to get a quick pair of glasses made. About another $400 setback. Contact lens wear time is not set to make more money for the eye docs. Your eye will literally develop a sore to tell you that it needs to breathe. Please help out your eyes. I don't know how anyone can sleep in their contacts. It feels like when you wake up and your mouth is so dry not even the tears of Jesus would quench your thirst except it's your eyeballs. I had a little old lady come in complaining of coughing up blood. She was spitting up huge clots of blood every few minutes and had pain in her throat. I asked her if she had done anything for the pain. She told me, well I smoked some crack. I asked her if she normally smokes crack. She said, no, I'm a drinker, but I thought it might help. Moral of the story, crack will not help you, with anything. I could nurse, took care of an 18 year old who got into a fight with his mom about not letting him borrow the car that night. He got so mad he rammed his head into a wall, giving himself a brain bleed. He woke up out of surgery and his mom had to prompt him to acknowledge the neurosurgeon who saved his life. All he said was appreciate it. I caught him taking pictures throwing up gang signs in his craniotomy cap. Just so dumb. 
not a doctor or nurse, but my sister was diagnosed with acute hemorrhagic pancreatitis when she was 16. Causes crappy genes. She cannot eat anything with fats. When she was discharged after an almost one year stay in the hospital, she sneakily ate a small chunk of fried pork. Goddamn we were immediately thrown back to square one. Thankful that miracles happened twice. Nursing student here. Female patient had an indwelling catheter to help void her urine. She had fluid overload from heart failure. I was at the nursing station giving my cosigned nurse a report when I saw my patient walk up to us and start speaking to us in Greek. It took me about 2 seconds to realize that she didn't have her walker with her. Another 2 seconds to notice she didn't have her catheter with her either. I walked her back to bed and saw the catheter attached to her bedpost with the balloon still fully inflated. I'm going to go wash my brain out with soap now. And maybe sit on an ice pack or two. My bits her just reading that. It. You just have to keep reading in order to purge the previous stories that made you recoil. Eventually you'll get to a point where you come to a story that doesn't make you flinch as much as the others. Quit then. Thanks for the checkpoint. I'm getting out of here. Not a doctor or a nurse. Just the niece of a man that, after having a surgery performed on his gut and being told not to eat anything for the next 24 hours, decided to get chili cheese fries at Wendy's on his way home from the hospital. He went right back and his condition worsened. Also, my fiancé's mother is a nurse and told us that a man came in once with a tiny gut to snake up his urethra. It had been there 4 weeks before he came in because he was too embarrassed to admit he let the snake go exploring on purpose before it got stuck and died inside of him. So he promptly died of septicemia. I have had enough of this thread. I had a patient the other day come in totally altered, with a blood pressure of like... 73 stroke 45. Turns out he took his blood pressure at home and seeing that it was elevated, decided to take his blood pressure medications. The thing is, he had never taken these medications before, one being prescribed in 2016 and the other in 2017, by different physicians, who didn't know about the other prescription. After we got his pressure up and he started talking sense he started complaining of a terrible headache. I told him. Well yeah you have a headache, you just underperfused your brain for who knows how long. You should be thankful you don't have brain damage. Moral of the story, always tell your physician all the medications you are prescribed, whether you take them or not. Woman came in the or to get her foot amputated. She got into the or and cancelled the procedure because the walls were green. RN, take my advice, if you are a fragile diabetic with end stage renal disease, don't do C. Just don't. Mid-twenties female with a less than stellar outcome. She died. I spent literally years putting her into IQ because of her own crappy decisions. She was a frequent flyer in my ear. So it was only a matter of time until she put herself into a hearse. I mean, I feel doing C is unhealthy regardless of whether you're diabetic or not. But yeah, no. Don't do that. He had chest pain. So he took some C. He may or may not have been having a heart attack before he did the coke. But he was definitely having one by the time I saw him. C puts a lot of stress on the heart and can cause heart attacks even in healthy people. This guy ended up okay. But he either gave himself a heart attack. Or he turned a small heart attack into a much bigger one. Even when I was in active addiction. I never used C because I heard it could cause your heart to explode. In hindsight it was probably a good thing I never did coke and also got sober because I found out shortly after that I have a congenital heart defect and had spent most of my life in heart failure. I don't consider this all that crazy but it happens a lot so I want to warn people against it. I used to work in the ED and would occasionally see patients who had had a bad fall several days prior and had hit their head. Rather than go to the ED immediately, they usually choose to treat their ensuing headaches with a painkiller. The older generation seem to prefer aspirin. The thing about aspirin is that it is a blood thinner. So what would have potentially been a small concussion was then a life threatening and often life altering condition. Don't treat pain with aspirin. Recently had a patient with diabetic neuropathy. Numbness tingling pain in your feet because unchecked diabetes ruins your nerves with time. Pour hot honey all over his feet because he thought it would help. He ended up having third degree burns all over his feet requiring multiple skin grafts. Needless to say, he still has neuropathy. Medical professionals over it. 
When was someone's self-diagnosis surprisingly accurate? Saw someone uh, she had a runny nose and was insistent that her cerebrospinal fluid, the fluid that surrounds your brain, was leaking through her nose and causing her to have a runny nose. This is usually pretty unlikely, especially without a history of trauma. Order a CT of her head, but doesn't show anything and she otherwise looks fine so she's sent home. She comes back the next day with a jar of this fluid she had collected saying this isn't not ran some more tests and turned out she was right. I'm glad she was persistent. I naively didn't even know this was a thing until reading your comment, yet I shall now forever presume every cold or onset of allergies is an indicator of brain fluid leaking from my nose. Super. Poor woman's husband drags her to her repeatedly for weeks on end with a bizarre variety of neurological symptoms. She'd seen a neurologist and was told it was all functional. MRI showed a rapidly growing brain tumor. She was having seizures. Her husband was 100% right. My blood turns cold just typing this. Poor woman. Poor family. Had a guy come into the air. He handed me a paper on brucellosis, saying that he had an infection with brucella. Turns out he was a large animal vet professor at a university, and was working in a lab studying the disease. He was right. Something like hey doc I'm one of the lead researchers on this disease, I know how to treat it. Here's a list of all the tests you need to run and what drugs I'll need to get better. I know how to treat it, but I don't have the script pad. Just the other week, had a 60 year old guy, reeking of cigarettes, come in for upper endoscopy, camera to look at the esophagus, stomach and part of the small bowel, he was describing food getting stuck mid swallow in the middle of his chest, I think it's esophagus cancer he said, I was thinking that too, but didn't say anything, sure enough, that's exactly what it was. My husband had an issue with the food getting stuck mid swallow for like a year or so, he said he just chalked it up to getting older. But when he was scanned after a motorcycle accident, doctors told him he had an 8 cm mass in his esophagus. He had it removed. Thankfully not cancerous. Obligatory not a medical professional, but I have a funny story about self-diagnosis from when I was in a motorcycle accident. It was a head-on collision and I had go over the hood and windshield of the car that hit me and skidded through an intersection. Was wearing a helmet, boots, leather jacket. I absolutely had a massive concussion but wasn't aware of it at the time. I was not in pain. I felt disoriented and insanely thirsty, but no pain. I sat up and took off my helmet and there was a crowd of bystanders trying to get me to lay down, but I just wanted to go home. The thing is, no matter how many times I tried, I could not actually stand. When the EMTs arrived, I was sitting upright on the ground, and I helpfully informed them that I thought my leg might be broken, because I had tried to stand and found it was not weight bearing. One of the EMTs scoffed and said something like you think or no crap. I very sincerely insisted my leg might be broken, at which point he got serious and asked me if I had actually looked at my leg or not. I hadn't thought to do that. Bear in mind I had one heck of a concussion. I looked down, and there was my bone sticking out from my skin and through the denim of my jeans. There was blood everywhere. Oh, I said, yes, your leg is definitely broken said the EMT gently. Well, I said, reasonably, I mean, how do we know yet? I mean, we should probably get an x-ray. Shock is a hell of a drug. When trauma patients say, am I going to die right before they lapse into unconsciousness or get tubed for surgery? They are usually right, and they know it. Hydradenitis suppurativa, recurrent severe skin abscesses. She came in saying that she was worried she had it because she's had some abscesses in her armpit. 9 times out of 10 it's because of shaving with a dirty razor, which is what I told her. I'll be damned if she was right. Ended up having 5 plus abscesses that formed tracts requiring surgery. They recurred a few months later. Sent to dermatology who confirmed the diagnosis. Worked in the air when a lady ran in screaming that her husband was dead in the car. Staff walked out to see, I asked if they should hurry and they said no because people exaggerate those things. Turns out dude was dead. Based on the smell and bloating, had been for 3 or 4 days. She was a junkie and was living in the car half a days before she noticed he had odd. I mean, technically they still didn't have to hurry. When I worked as a camp counselor, I woke up one morning with severe joint pain. 
I'd slept on the ground the night before so I chalked it up to that. When it didn't go away after a couple days, I went to the camp nurse who diagnosed me with dehydration. After downing a 12 pack of Powerade, I'm still surprised I didn't pee blue, I still had the joint pain. A bunch of the other counselors were convinced that it was stress or that the fluid in my joints had dried up. Then I went and did the one thing you should never do. I logged onto WebMD and searched my symptoms. And right after cancer was Lyme disease. It made a lot of sense but I'd never had any rash or notice any tick on me. So I went back to the camp nurse and she had me leave camp to get a blood test and I ended up going into the ear because there wasn't a clinic available. The nurse gave me a shot in the butt for the pain. Drew my blood and an antibiotic on an empty stomach just in case. Turns out I was allergic to the antibiotic so I got hives and I threw it up. I received a call the next day that yes, I did have Lyme disease. Dried up joints, my butt. <laughs> Disclaimer, I worked part time in Tridge at the air, so I'm not sure if you'd call me a professional. That being said, I don't remember a single person who claimed they had a kidney stone who was wrong. The only person I ever had who didn't have a kidney stone, and wasn't seeking, unfortunately had a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. I diagnosed myself with an adrenal tumor. My primary care doc kept telling me my symptoms were caused by lifestyle choices. I went to my gin who took me seriously when I showed him my research. It was a cancerous bioactive adrenal tumor the size of a grapefruit. That was over 2 years ago and I'm still fighting this cancer. I developed either recurrence or mets a few months after my initial surgery and I've been dealing with liver and lung mets ever since. I won the argument with my primary care doc but my prize was cancer. Sad trombone. Not nearly as dramatic, but apparently scabies. Literal heck on earth. Is hard to diagnose. I noticed the symptoms pretty quickly and thought my childhood eczema had come back to haunt me. When treatment for that only seemed to make it worse, I figured out that it had to be scabies. All the normal problem areas, itchy at night, etc. The problem was, I couldn't get the lotion to treat it without a doctor signing off. I went to the doctor and she immediately starts diagnosing me with everything besides scabies while I'm telling her multiple times that it's most definitely scabies. I went 3-4 times and the last time I left when she refused to allow me to get the treatment cream and wanted to say I had allergies instead. I told her I was not putting up with this torture while she keeps taking my money and misdiagnosing me and she goes well I'm sorry, you aren't getting scabies treatment without a doctor's note. And I really don't think you have scabies. Apparently she never heard of Amazon. I went home ordered permethrin, SP, 10% off Amazon, 5% is what's used for treatment, mixed it with a thick lotion and crap cleared right up. I was so tempted to call her and let her know, but she probably would have said one of her earlier attempts at treatment finally worked. Dude, get a new doctor. Not a doctor but a patient. Had pancreatitis a few years ago, around 2014. Always had stomach problems, but no idea why until that day. Two years later, in 2016, I had the same terrible pain. Tried to wait it out for 5 or so days, but broke down and went to the air. I said I think I have pancreatitis, was treated like a drug seeking alcoholic, and I stopped drinking in 2014 because of the pancreatitis. Doctor tried to tell me it was indigestion. When I asked why I was in constant pain even when I haven't eaten in 3 days was when the doctor completely changed her attitude and pretty much told me we're not going to help you. About 3 months later my lipase levels were high enough to be considered an attack. So I was admitted and was diagnosed with chronic pancreatitis. Not alcohol related. I still think about that doctor and it makes me so angry. I wonder if my life could have been a little better if they took me seriously and found it out sooner. 2017 has been rough. That's super rough. I hope you're doing better, and that 2018 is a much better year for you. I'm not medic but one of my co-workers is. His best story. Once a woman came to hospital to prove herself diagnosed diabetic. Blood test proved it. Doctor asked how did she know it. She answered that her urine is too sticky. And it makes sense. High sugar level can affect urine too. After hurting my knee and having to ice it all the time, I found I kept breaking out in hives after the ice. I went to the doctor and told him I thought I had cold induced urticaria, allergic to cold. My parents scoffed at it, 
The doctor had never had a patient with this so it was dismissed. After it kept happening to me I got them to send me to an allergist. My parents thought I was crazy until the doctor confirmed my diagnosis and handed my parents information on anaphylaxis. But at least now I get a handicapped parking pass in the winter and don't have to shovel the walk. I live in Canada. Not a medical professional, but I got hand foot and mouth disease back in my senior year of high school. I knew it was that because we were working with the virus that causes it in my biotech class. Doctor told me that there was no way I had it, because only children get it, and it rarely occurs in the winter. So he ordered a couple expensive tests, and sure enough I had it. By far the most miserable two weeks of my life. I got it last year, I was 23, doctors denied my claims too, since it's so rare in adults, they tried telling me I had chicken pox, number, I was right, hfm, caught off my kids. Patient not doc, but I was almost as amazed as my pcp when I was right so I'll share, my dad had been diagnosed with afib and an arrhythmia a year prior, he was told that most people are not diagnosed until they have a problem. My dad took me and my kids to the science center where they had an exhibit all about the human body. There is a section all about the heart. They had several things that would monitor your heart rate, including a drum that would beat along with your heart when you touched sensors. Everyone else had nice steady heartbeats show up on all of the little things that they had, but mine kept acting funny and so did my dad's. The thing was I didn't have any symptoms and I felt perfectly normal so I didn't think that it would actually mean anything. It's basically a toy, right? I told myself I'd feel dumb if I didn't mention it to my doctor in case there was a link. When I suggested that I thought I had arrhythmia because the science center gadget didn't pick up my heart rate the same as everybody else my doctor looked at me a little funny, but ran the tests. Sure enough they found it and did a few more tests to establish a baseline for comparison later on in life. A fib is scary cause you can have it for years and not even know. Apple is actually using the built-in heart monitor on the Apple watches to run a crap ton of medical studies on situations like a fib to both help catch it early and monitor it. IDK if you have an iPhone, but if you do, look into it. I went to my doctor because I thought I had appendicitis. He agreed and sent me to the hospital. They ran tests, said I was fine and should go home. I refused, called my doctor, who called them and made them rerun the tests with someone who knew what they were doing. They came back to me and had me in surgery within two hours. I had a dude come in the ear the other night and tell us he thinks he was shot. He absolutely nailed that one. But in all seriousness it was GSW to the head and the MRI was gnarly. Everyone with the MRI question. Most bullets are composed of non-ferromagnetic material but yes it is a case by case call. Careful consideration of risk benefit is therefore recommended in all patients. There is an MRI screening done by an on-site rad if one isn't available the screening goes to a Telerid facility to ok the go ahead. This is all post CT. My stepfather is a doctor and told me two stories. One was an older Irish woman who correctly predicted that she had a tumor in her left lung roughly the size of a golf ball. She has never smoked or done anything that made her a risk but she insisted her very mild cough was the result of a large tumor and demanded to have it checked out. She was dead on and claimed she saw a person on TV with the same symptoms and when she fell asleep her dead husband in her dream told her to go to the doctor and her she was. The second was a guy who said he felt like he was stabbed and thought something went wrong with his surgery when they removed a cyst from his lung. He was half right. The surgery went fine but he had a thin strip of metal sheesh kababing him through the chest because he apparently plopped onto his bed without removing some junk including a large 6 inch receipt spike. His bandages covered up the new wound. In other words it felt like he was stabbed because he was stabbed. Bonus. An old lady told a room full of very alarmed doctors who thought she was ridden with very dense possibly calcified tumors that they didn't need to worry also those dots are probably from the time a crazy guy shot her with a shotgun when she was 15. But it's okay now because she forgives him as it's God's job to judge you know. They had two of the pellets removed as one was sitting on her heart and another was pressing into a blood vein but easy to get to and left the other 25 in. Weirdest thing my stepfather says is that she made it to 80 years old without ever getting an x-ray of anything but her foot so there wasn't a single word of it mentioned anywhere. He apparently plopped onto his bed without removing some junk including a large 6 inch receipt spike. Why? Why would you put that on your bed? 
not a medical professional, but 4th grade me, mid 1990s, had a terrible shooting pain in my stomach. It got to the point where I couldn't walk. The doctor told me on the first visit it was probably a stomach virus and gave me some meds. I was staying home from school due to the pain and was watching Full House, and Jesse had to go to the hospital and get his appendix removed. I was so freaked out I made my parents take me back to the doctor the next day. I was crying and told the doc I think I had appendicitis. He did some checks and confirmed it. Surgery same day. After surgery they told me if it waited another few days it would have burst. Full house may have saved my life. I caught whooping cough, bordetella pertussis, and literally begged the doctors to run tests. Weeks and weeks passed and they just told me it wasn't whooping cough, but I was catching back to back flu cold bronchitis. Girlfriend also caught it and we again begged them to run tests to which they told us they don't want us because by now they can't treat us anyways, so it made no difference. I explained that as they told me it was just a cold, I'd been going to work for weeks, while sick. I hate this too, but I wanted to keep my job so I went, and two colleagues have newborns, so it would be good to warn them in case they catch it off me. They ran the tests and diagnosed us, but such a pain in the butt. I watched the episode of Grey's Anatomy where there was a patient with severe migraines and Eric Shepard can't figure out where his pain is coming from. Mark Sloan comes in, looks at him and shoves a pencil up his nose, diagnosing him with a deviated septum. For years I had suffered with migraines and headaches and recently stopped breathing fully out of one side of my nose. Stuck my finger up. Felt bone. Went to the doctor a few days later. My general doctor didn't believe me. I went to an ent and told him what I thought was wrong. And by golly I was right. Severely deviated septum. Had surgery a few weeks later. My wife Sobe Jin was out of the country when she started to go into labor. Her blood pressure had been high but we were monitoring it. In the hospital it was through the roof. I looked at her chart. Researched everything online and told the doctor on call that she has H-E-L-L-P. He ignored me. Said it was fine. When the delivery was almost done her blood pressure dropped to nothing. A nurse shot her up with something. Because the doctor was busy eating lunch. And she recovered but I will never forget holding my wife's hand thinking that this might be the last time I see her alive. When her OB Jin got back to town she confirmed the diagnosis I gave independently. We live in a small town. The doctor avoids me. I can imagine for good reason. Two, I would have a few fists to say to someone who nearly cost me my so's life on the goddamn birthing table. Once while I was working as an EMT, we ran a call for a guy who had gotten s faced and fell flat on his face on the sidewalk outside his apartment, cutting open his forehead. At the hospital, he was told he would be breathalyzed to obtain a back and loudly proclaimed I'm feeling eyeing. .308. He promptly blew a .308 and the whole team applauded. These are the best kind of drunk people. The ones who know how fricked up they truly are. My gran was having chest pains and thought she was either having a heart attack or indigestion from a pastrami sandwich. So she went to the doctor. While she was there her BP was 210 stroke 90. The doctor said that she was obviously having indigestion and that the pain she was having was gas pockets. And prescribed her an antacid and a higher dose blood pressure medication than she was already taking. She took it and her pressure bottomed out. I took her to the hospital and found out she had been having a heart attack for the past 2 days. She died that night. I'm still bitter 18 years later. The best. Worst. Part is no lawyer would take the case against him because she was old and was going to die sooner anyhow. But that's still medical malpractice. Head desks dang lawyers. My son came home from Iraq with a weird skin lesion that the army doctors diagnosed as psoriasis. I didn't buy it. I did some research online and suspected it was leishmaniasis, an infection transmitted via sand fleas. I took him to a private dermatologist and presented my research. The dermatologist sent a biopsy to the CDC and got the official diagnosis. The army still insisted on labeling it a non-specific skin irritation. They didn't want to pay for the expensive drug regime. I hired a lawyer. The army gave in and paid for the treatment. Sure, it cost us about the same to push them into it as if we just paid out of pocket, but it was worth it to force them to put the proper diagnosis into my son's records. Oh man. 
finally a spot to post a story. I'm a Navy corpsman, so I've heard my fair share of interesting stories and self-diagnosis from Marines. This one is probably the only one that has ever truly caught me completely off guard though. A young lady comes in and asks me in a low voice if she could talk to me in private before she made her appointment. Usually, that meant one of two things. An STD check or some sort of feminine concern. Genitourinary symptoms. Wanting contraception. Pregnancy. So I took her to a quiet, semi-isolated area and asked her what's wrong. I have worms coming out of my anus. And I think I got it from my cat. My initial response was, okay, um, what makes you think that? She describes the worms and why she thought that. For the record, her symptoms were, an itching in the anus, worse at night, and she had seen felt little wriggly things when defecating. Her cat had been diagnosed with worms and slept with them in the bed and her husband was also showing symptoms. I take the history as best I can, go to my provider, explain it to her. She is just as confused as I am but says well, if she says it's worms, let's get a fecal sample. And lo, she returned two days later with a fecal sample that tested positive. I have a couple other stories I'm happy to share, but this one was the most off the wall one. When I saw got it from my cat I was worried where that story way is going. I correctly self diagnosed a blood clot in my leg. I went to the ear with excruciating pain in my calf and told the doctor that I suspected a blood clot. The doctor assured me that I was young and healthy and I wasn't at risk for a blood clot. He diagnosed it as a pulled muscle, offered me some painkillers and sent me home. Fast forward 2 or 3 weeks, I still had excruciating pain in my calf. And I started to develop severe shortness of breath. I went to the urgent care clinic this time. The doctor at the urgent care clinic immediately suspected a blood clot and sent me to the ear for some tests. The ear doctor did an ultrasound on my leg, declared that I didn't have a blood clot, and sent me home. The next morning, someone from the ear called me and sheepishly admitted that they had misread the test the night before, and I did in fact have a blood clot. It turned out that I had had a blood clot in my leg all along and the clot had broken off and traveled to my lungs. Thankfully, I've made a full recovery, despite nearly being killed by the incompetence of multiple doctors. Very sad case, a young woman obsessed with breast exams and mammograms because she just knew something was wrong. Obviously written off by lots of doctors because the mammograms always came back clean, until one day they didn't. She was diagnosed stage 3 when someone decided to finally take her seriously. Two years ago I started having a short, sharp pain in my head like I had swallowed ice cream. Brain freeze. Every morning when I stood up out of bed and when I stood up after my first morning pee, I didn't think much of it. It was like this for a month and then started to become more frequent whenever I stood up. The head pain gradually started coming out of nowhere like when I laughed or sneezed and lasting longer and longer. Then one day it came out of nowhere so intent like a freight train in my head I was screaming in agony. It was unreal and I thought I would die, way beyond a migraine. That's when I figured out that literally as soon as I hung my head down the pain would completely go away, until I lifted my head back up. If I waited with my head down long enough around an hour, the pain would be gone for a good while. So from then on I started just going upside down or laying down with my head over the couch whenever I felt the pain. I also then figured out that taking massive amounts of caffeine made the pain go away. The pain was still unreal every time but I had a super easy way of making it go away. Unfortunately it started to interfere with my work obviously because I have a desk job, software developer, and I had to take long breaks and hang my head. I actually started a new job at this time and on literally my first day I was hit with the pain and my new boss grabbed a trash can for me to throw up in. It really became clear I had to do something. So I googled head pain when upright or something like that. Found out about intracranial hypertension and from there, chiari malformation. I figured out that hanging my head made my brain go back up and give CSF some more room to flow in and cushion my brain. That's why it helped. My husband drove me to the air. I said I think I have Chiari please do an MRI. They did and saw Chiari and severe intracranial hypertension. Got sent to a neurosurgeon and 2 weeks later I had brain decompression surgery. From what I read Chiari usually takes 5 years to be diagnosed. It took a year and a half of recovery before the pain mostly went away but it's all good now. 
I'm a nurse but these are me as the patient stories. When I was in high school, I started feeling very run down. It started with a cold, then a bad sore throat. I started sleeping a lot more and didn't eat as much. At that time I was a walking garbage disposal. My dad took me to urgent care. They did the typical strep test which was negative. My dad asked if it could be mono. The doctor laughed it off. Said it was an upper respiratory virus. Take some Tylenol for pain and I can can continue my normal routine. Week later, we're back at urgent care as my condition only got worse. I lost 10 pounds and was ridiculously pale for mid-August. My dad demanded a mono test. And guess what? That's what I had. The doctor then changed his tune to I need a lot of sleep and fluids. Frick you, doctor, Hermane. Next, my first year as a nurse. I started feeling off. I would forget mid-sentence what I was talking about and entire conversations. I started getting too tired. I was sleeping 16 hours and that didn't feel like enough. I was always freezing cold, aside from the normal Ohio April, and at random intervals. My arms would either get numb or get pins and needle feelings. Got myself a primary care physician, went to my appointment. I told the woman I'm pretty sure I'm anemic. She argued, ordered a pregnancy test, negative, tried prescribing me antidepressants saying that was the issue. I got pee and demanded blood work to be done. My lab work comes back, another round of mono, and anemia. The doctor who called to tell me my results apologized profusely and we had a good laugh about maybe that's why I'm so tired. TL. DR. Frick Lake Health. I had a patient come in once because he noticed that morning that he was blind in one eye. Yup, easily confirmed. He had lost all sight in one eye, gradually over years likely, and 50% of the vision in the other. First eye examination ever. My wife suspected, based on the HCG levels from her tests versus how far along she was in the pregnancy, that she was carrying twins. The doctor thought she just tracked her cycle incorrectly, even said we were having a singleton during the first ultrasound. During the second ultrasound, found the second baby, we're now parents of twins. Doctors and surgeons of Reddit, what was your this just got even worse moment with your patient s? One of the worst things I've ever seen in healthcare, young woman in her 20s comes in with an infected heart from injecting drugs. Her infection and heart failure are pretty much past the point of recovery. Her only option was basically IV antibiotics. Hope they work. And if they don't go to hospice, the antibiotics get the infection somewhat under control. But the heart valve damage is too much. Her heart starts throwing little micro clots. Her fingertips got purplish and she eventually throws clots to her lungs and starts struggling to breathe. She comes to my IQ. Charge nurse at the time. For bip up. She decides to make herself a DNR and proceed with hospice. But in my state, DNRs and living wills don't mean crap once you become unresponsive and your family member takes proxy. Her mom, who she was not on good terms with, went to court to receive healthcare proxy rights once she became too disoriented to maintain capacity for medical decision making. As mom rescinded her DNR. We interbut her. She spends weeks months on the ventilator throwing clots despite heparin. Her arms and legs become purple, black, green, necrotic. Her abdomen even started to break down and come necrotic. She threw clots to her brain and became totally unresponsive no longer requiring sedation. We took the case to risk management. We held ethics meetings. We went to court against the mother to revoke her healthcare proxy to fight for the patient's right to die with dignity. The court refused. Mom remained proxy. The patient eventually coded. I initiated CPR and ran her code with the physician. Performing CPR with so much necrosis was beyond disturbing. She did not survive. Things became problematic in the morgue a few days later. I had to go to the morgue and add a secondary body bag to contain everything. I cared for a patient with drug induced endocarditis. She had presented to ED with sepsis and by the time that she made it to our hospital, the MRI had picked up septic emboli in her brain. I left before she was discharged, but she was so incredibly incoherent. It was traumatizing. I was a resident in IQ and we had a patient recovering from Steven Johnston syndrome. Rare drug reaction where skin blisters and dies. He also had a clotted femoral pseudoaneurysm. Basically a bulge in the femoral artery that's at risk of bursting and bleeding. 
Between afternoon and evening rounds this patient's nurse asked me to assess the patient's leg because it seemed to be swelling. His whole body was swollen because of all the inflammation he had and fluids he'd been getting for his blood pressure. But his right leg did look more swollen than a few hours ago and the skin breakdown was worse. But his aneurysm was stable on the ultrasound earlier in the day so it didn't seem like there was much to do other than keep it well dressed and monitor. A couple hours later me, my co-resident, and our fellow were doing our evening rounds as the general surgery team is assessing a patient a few doors down. The leg looks even worse than earlier. Another few cm swollen and more skin breakdown. All his vitals are okay. He's on appropriate therapy. The three of us plus his nurse and trying to decide what to do when right in front of us his leg splits open and blood comes pouring out. For an instant I think maybe this is just some subcutaneous hematoma that burst. But then I see more blood rapidly bubbling out of his leg. The nurse and my co-resident throw on gloves and apply pressure while the fellow grabs a surgical kit and tries to find the source of the bleed. I rip down the hall and grab the surgeons who are still evaluating their patient and within 2 minutes there's a small team of surgeons gowned and gloves searching through this man's leg looking for the bleeding vessel. Another minute or two later and they've found the vessel, a vein, and stopped the bleeding as best they can. I think on the repeat blood work that evening he'd lost maybe 10-20% of his blood in that 5 minute period. The problem was the infection now. He was pretty sick and frail to start with and had already had a near fatal reaction to one class of antibiotics. But now when his leg burst open and starting bleeding out there was no time to go off and grab sterile gloves. We just had to throw on the gloves we had and apply pressure. His wound became purulent and he developed bacteria in the blood. With all the other medical problems he was having it was just too much and he ended up going palliative. A close college friend of mine became a surgeon. Between undergraduate graduation and the end of his residency, I noticed a marked change in his personality. He became a lot more serious and somber. He hinted that a lot of it was from his time working in the air but never said more than that. Now that I've read your story, I can see why he changed so much. Thanks for sharing. Not a doc. But as an EMT trainee, I did my first ride along on an ambulance and we went to check out a guy who fell at a skate park. When we got there he was conscious, could walk, and talking coherently. He'd fallen and hit his head, no helmet. But we did a full inspection anyway, careful avoiding the obvious bruise forming above his eye. Not much blood, pupils were normal, didn't seem bad, probably concussion and a black eye. Well he could have turned us down. But we talked him into coming with us to the adjust to double check everything. So we get him in the ambulance, lay him down, and it was my job to check his blood pressure. It had gone down significantly since first check. Well it didn't take long and he seemed to be losing consciousness, getting sleepy, and then, he starts throwing up blood. That would be the things just got even worse moment. We turned on the sirens at that point, the paramedics started fluids, blood pressure kept dropping, it was no bueno. He was unconscious by the time we got to the air. It sounded like he just barely got there in time. Head wounds bleed a lot as we found out, and not always obviously. That part we skipped. Touching the bruise above his eye because it was obviously going to hurt him, well we shouldn't have skipped it. If we had, it would have felt super mushy, because all that bone around his eye and cheek was crushed. And all the blood, well it was draining down his throat and into his stomach. He ended up having emergency brain surgery, where on top of all the other stuff, they found and removed a tumor. Pretty crazy for a first ride along. Hope he's doing well now, and wearing a helmet. Jesus Christ. As an EMT in training I will remember this story. As residents, we were caring for a toddler admitted to the Hymonk ward with a newly diagnosed tumor, neuroblastoma. Her mom just delivered a baby at the adult hospital across the street 3 days ago and because she's nursing, baby sister is allowed to stay in big sister's hospital room with mom. Nurses call in the middle of the night because baby sister doesn't look right. They're right. She is blue. Poorly responsive and breathing hard. Looks terrible. We take baby sis right to the air downstairs where she is promptly intubated and resuscitated and diagnosed with a cyanotic heart lesion and is in the cath lab within an hour for a temporizing procedure and undergoes successful open heart surgery the following day. Probably a miracle that she was in a tertiary children's hospital when she deteriorated. I'm not sure she would have survived if she had presented to their local rural a 2-3 hours away. Had a young, mid-30s. 
patient with metastatic cancer, cancer that spread to other sites in the body, including both proximal femurs, hip bones, and the pelvis. Cancer progressed and spread despite various chemo regimens and a clinical trial. We, orthopedic surgery, got consulted to assess if it was safe for him to walk, do physical therapy in the hospital with the bone lesions, and possibly put metal rods into his femurs to strengthen them and allow him to walk. Two days later he had a massive stroke involving 60-70% of the left side of his brain. In a matter of hours, this poor guy went from having terminal metastatic cancer, to also being paralyzed on the right side of his body and being unable to speak, aphasia. Leighton not a doctor but, I'm a paramedic and we were responding to a suspected drunk driving accident. The police arrested the driver. We were checking on the passenger in the back of the sedan that barely had a scratch on it, a fender bender at most. Dude is super out of it with a tiny cut on the back of his head. He is resistant to everything getting out of the car, getting on the stretcher, assessing him, taking vitals, etc. He just closes his eyes and pushes us away. We tried asking him what happened to his head and we refused to answer. There's no way that cut happened from the tiny fender bender. It just didn't make sense. Anyways, we take him to the hospital. Just another belligerent drunk, right? So a few hours later, we check back in with the doctor to see what his blood alcohol content was. She says it was 0%. We say that can't be right. Everyone in the car was drunk. The driver and front passenger. Turns out our patient actually had a basilar skull fracture and bilateral subdural hematomas and absolutely no idea how it happened. It taught me to assume there's a medical traumatic cause to the patient's condition before assuming substances caused it. Inkton year. This happens right at handover as I'm coming on. Patient had dysphagia from multiple intubations, inability to swallow well, weakness in the swallow muscles, nosebleed starts. He had nosebleeds before that weren't too serious. It's still going. We are giving Afrin, vasoconstrictor in the nose to tighten the blood vessels, and holding mad pressure. End is like OMW and rushed over. End looking inside the throat. There is a clot in there. I watch as the clot falls down this man's throat. O2 sat 98%, comma 60%. HR 140. 50 I immediately know this guy is about to code. Get the cart. No pulse, 9 EP pushes and like 11 or 12 round CPR we are going to call time of death but the man had a faint pulse after that last round. During the code anesthesia intubates the patient and pulls out a bratwurst sized clot out of the trachea. But dang he bled way brisker than we could see. He still died that night due to shock, low BP, despite 3 pressers, blood pressure raising medications, being maxed. Honestly it was a miracle he survived the initial illness that brought him into the hospital but I still cried when I got home because it was a particularly difficult death for me to process. A doc here. Patient arrived with complaints of vaginal spotting. History revealed she had been bleeding for 2 days. Not very heavy, just a little pain. Stated it started after her female partner had been a little rough during their last sexual experience. Physical exam revealed a complete tear through the posterior vaginal wall into the rectum consistent with what we would usually see during a difficult childbirth. The situation was a bit fishy given the amount of trauma and the backstory so I ordered the usual tests, blood count, coagulation panel, chemistries. In accordance with all protocol, she was definitely going to surgery, tacked on a urine pregnancy test, even though she denied the possibility of pregnancy given her sexual preferences. The pregnancy test came back positive. Needless to say this opened a huge can of worms. Turns out, she had delivered a child two days ago in secret but didn't tell anyone. Had been hiding the child from her family girlfriend, child protective services, the police, EMS, pediatrics, on gin all got involved in the matter of minutes after that revelation. They found the child in her apartment under some towels alone in her home. It was a doozy of a night. To those who are wondering, yes, she was a larger woman whose pregnancy was hidden by her size. This happened 5 years ago and I have seen the child since, doing well with her grandparents who have full guardianship. Wonder how the girlfriend reacted to all this, if she was hiding it from her. Not a doctor, but the cause of some doctor's oh crap moment. So, quick backstory, 
I came out of a tree the hard way when a half grown cat I was trying to rescue took a swipe at my eyes and I jerked backwards. Landed on the concrete patio about 12 feet below, which had a little curb that was like 2 inches wide and inch and half high. Oh, and the cat jumped down and landed on my chest. Naturally, I had a big bruise right across my lower back, just below the belt line. It was a Friday. My dad said to wait before going to a and e Englisher. They're swamped at weekends. Figured. He's a doctor. So he knew better. Turns out. No he didn't. So there I was sitting on the bed after being x-rayed. And a very pale looking doc comes in and the very first thing he says is. Don't move. Stay perfectly still. I'd cracked the three lowest lumbar vertebrae. According to the surgeon. I was probably the luckiest guy that day. They'd split and broken in such a way they jammed against each other and totally missed all the nerves. Well. Almost, I've a dead patch on my right thigh I can't feel a thing with and a bit of a limp when I'm tired. I ended up in a body cast for a few weeks after they fused the broken bits, never had a problem since aside from the back being stiff enough I can't bend at the waist too well. And yeah, I've never let dad live it down. He's a darn fine heart guy, top of his field, but he's a lousy EMT. Walk it off is not good advice for someone with a back injury, it's okay. He says it keeps him humble. I worked as a medic back in the day, specifically a mountain medic at a ski resort. Most of the time, like 90% of the time, it was people who feel on the mountain. About the most exciting thing was a broken femur, in which case they were getting their pants cut off. On a rare occasion you would have other medical events, but most people on skis are fit and healthy adjacent. Most of the non-accident stuff happened at the lodge. And since the fire station was literally across the parking lot, they would just call them first. But their jump bags were better equipped for medical rather than trauma. They got called in a heart attack and weren't in the station because they were transporting to the hospital. A lady in her 40s had slipped and fell on some ice. She appeared fine, but we needed to medically clear her. So they called us down mountain from our clinic at the upper lodge. I have no idea why I grabbed it. But I threw our cardiac bag in the liter and we ran down on the snowmobile. I didn't think I would need it and because typically we have to transport someone in the liter we don't pack it unless the call seems we might need it. So I get to her and start asking questions. Palpating for broken bones or dislocated joints. A quick neuro and she seems fine. But there is just the slightest weakness in her left arm. I probably would have thought nothing of it because everything else was fine. But then I asked her history and current symptoms and my partner just flashed me BP. It was odd. But then she mentioned she was taking tums. I asked why. She had woken up that morning with really bad heartburn. So I insisted she come with me to a private clinic room we have. It's really just a cramped closer with a few chairs and a desk. She refuses. But I insist. I tell her I want to put a 4 lead DCG on. She's insistent that I don't, but I finally convince her that I'm not a doc, so I'm probably just being paranoid, but I really just want to be careful, so we pop her shirt open and quickly get the leads on, and yep, she's having a heart attack and it's pretty bad, I have no clue how she's standing, but women tend to have less of the big early symptoms and are tough as nails, so we get in a helicopter and down to the cardiac center, the air medic always passed me back status on my bigger patients. I like to know when I saved a life. She survived, but if she had waited till it was bad enough for her, she would have died before she would have gotten to a hospital. So, a minor slip and fall of a healthy young woman saved her life. More women need to know the symptoms of a heart attack. They're different from men and subtle and people just are not aware. So many. The 80 year old who came in with a self inflicted shotgun wound to the chest. As we are fighting to get him stabilized and the surgeons are working to plug all the holes. None of us can figure out why the guy keeps using blood. Then we find out that he had intentionally overdosed on blood thinners before shooting himself. We kept him alive long enough to let the family come into the ore and say goodbye. The 45 year old who came in via private car. Family drove him in. Rather than an ambulance. After what was described as a head injury, we realized how bad it was when someone noticed a plastic grocery bag lying on the patient's belly. It contained the brains that the family managed to scoop up, in the hopes that we could re-implant them. The 30-something M addict who also had a permanent catheter infusing life-saving medication directly into his chest for pulmonary hypertension. He came into the IQ with PH crisis, 
And then we found out why. He had been injecting M into the catheter, creating a hole through which his life-saving medication leaked out. The medicine is a lot of things. Sometimes it's just tragic. I was in the hospital recently and a nurse and security guard chased a girl down who was trying to leave with the IVE tub thing still in her arm so she could just put drugs right on in there. Homeless man is brought into the ED by M's for a foot wound that is giving him trouble. We eyeball his foot that's poking out from the blanket as he's rolling by and it's a little roughed up, but doesn't seem too bad. We go in to get his story and he says he hurt his foot a few days ago and that it just hurts to walk on. We ask if we can take a peek, so he whips off the blanket to show us his other foot, the one that is actual hurt, releasing a horrific stench cloud in the process. We knew we were in for a treat. Guy has his foot bandaged in a very dirty ace wrap. Toes are completely black and necrotic, and there's a maggot butt wiggling near the edge of the ace wrap. We tried to remove the wrap, but it was stuck together with blood, dirt and who knows what else, so time to cut that sucker off. As we cut more maggot began to present themselves, and the smell of dead flesh just kept getting more and more intense. We finally make it through and go to pull away the wrap and I swear at least a hundred maggot fell out of that thing. But that wasn't the worst part. The entire bottom of the man's foot was stuck to the wrap and just fell away from the underlying muscle and bone. We told the man we were unfortunately not going to be able to save the foot. To which he responded oh man, really? I didn't think it was that bad. The maggots probably saved him from sepsis tbh. Hi doctor here. You may have heard that diabetics need to have their eyes checked regularly because diabetes is actually a blinding condition. This happened probably about 15 years ago, but this patient of mine I had noted had severe diabetic vascular changes against the retina and required laser intervention as soon as possible. Without getting into the socio-economic arguments here, she scheduled her surgery and on the day of the surgery decided to take a work day instead of her surgery. Her job was cleaning, and on that fateful day, she inhaled some of her cleaner fumes which caused her to sneeze spiking her blood pressure and she blew the fragile blood vessels in both of her eyes wide open and blood started gushing into her eyes. As you might imagine, blood is opaque, you can't see through it. She was instantly and completely blinded in both eyes in a matter of seconds. It took 3 years, multiple surgeries, and a complete lifestyle change, but this patient did recover to have actually fair, but not good, vision. I still see her now for her annual visits. I'm never sneezing again a day in my life. Used to be an EMT. We were too far away to respond when this happened, but we heard it over the radio. Dispatch. Caller reports two children playing with garage or spring, reporting unknown injuries. Dispatch. Responding Leo. Law enforcement officer. Reporting possible juvenile fatality. M's. M's reporting juvenile fatality. We're gonna need a cleanup crew. It's a mess here. Can we get someone to confirm an injury is not compatible with life? M's. Yeah, we're gonna need another crew here. Kid was playing with a garage door. The spring snapped or something. And his face is gone. Dispatch. M's please repeat. What did you say? M's. There's brains on the wall. We need another M's rig here. Dispatch. Roger. I'll have another crew en route shortly. The tone in everyone's voice when talking about that on the radio is something I will never forget. The absolute pain in the voice of everyone after they heard one of the responding EMTs say that the kid was killed like that. Sah. Garage door springs are wound so tight that they can cut an adult in half. Please consult a professional when installing or fixing your garage door. Was coding a patient in room 1. I bring the family in before I call the code if they want, so they get a chance to say goodbye before I stop. Wife was clearly gone, had probably died hours before. Husband comes in, sees her laying there, grabs his chest and down he goes. His was a ventricular arrhythmia, VT, VF, ultimately resuscitated. I saw him a year later for something unrelated and he thanked me for saving his life and told me he wished he hadn't lived BC life without his wife wasn't worth living. Man that's sad, loving someone so much that when they die life seems to stop and it's not worth living. Obligatory not a doctor. I worked at a law firm that specialized in various injury cases, including medical malpractice and nursing home neglect. If you've ever heard of bed sores, 
you've probably thought of something akin to bruises or rashes or something. Oh no. At some of the really crappy nursing homes, people would stay on their back for months on end. I'm still not sure how it happens. I was just a lowly paralegal, but oh my god. It basically rots through your skin and then eats up your soft tissues. The pictures still haunt me. Imagine a living person who, when rolled onto their side, you can see a cavity where skin and flesh should have been. You can see their spine, and were you to reach your hand in, you could have wrapped your hand around it, seeing their organs. I'm just glad I was never there in person to smell it. It happens because pressure against a surface, the bed, prevents proper blood flow. Tissue without blood dies due to low oxygen, and necrotic tissue is food for bacteria and becomes easily infected. A terrible thing all around. Pick 1. These were all from my intern year in general surgery in the late 90s. 1. The beautiful 34 year old woman who manned a grill for 2 days during some sort of weekend festival for her church. Her eyes got irritated from the smoke off the grill so she asked her PMD for some eye drops. After using them for 2 days she developed a rash. They were tabramus in drops that rapidly progressed to cover her whole body. She developed TENS, aka toxic epidermal necrolysis syndrome, which essentially means the most superficial layer of the skin, epidermis, separates from the deeper layers, dermis. This leaves a wound that is similar to the raw spot underneath a big blister, but in her case it involved nearly 75% of her skin. She also developed GI bleeding as the mucous membranes, the moist tissues that line the inside of your mouth, esophagus, stomach and intestines, also separates and bleeds. At the time we had silver impregnated dressings, act a coat, that we had to wrap her in like a mummy and change every day. Despite everything we could do at the main burn unit in a huge metro area in the midwest, she died. 2. The husband and wife who were brought in at the same time, both with major flame burns. He was about 50% EBSA, total body surface area, and she was 75%. The woman was intubated at the original or they went to big burns are literally hot potatoes and will get transferred to the nearest burn center ASAP when they arrive in a small town -er. She was waking up a bit when she got to our unit and kept trying to mouth something around her breathing tube. In hindsight, I'm pretty sure it was my baby, as she miscarried about 36 hours after she was admitted, her nurse found the fetus in her bed. She developed an arrhythmia while we were starting a new central line big IV in the neck or chest, and we couldn't stop it, and she died. We later found out that the husband put their two kids in the car, then went back inside and choked her till she passed out, and then poured gasoline all over her and lit her on fire after he found out she was pregnant with someone else's baby. He also caught on fire. Gasoline will do that. He survived, got multiple skin grafts and went to jail. The kids were uninjured. Physically. That was during the first three weeks I was a doctor. I'll stick with my boring office job. This is easily the most fascinating thread I've ever had the pleasure of reading. If I wasn't flat broke I'd buy the lot of you gold. Holy heck. Not a doc but I used to work for radiology in a small hospital and was their kind of mister everything we don't want to do. Lifting. Security. Transport. Babysitter. Etc. A young mid-twenties couple gets brought in on backboards after a car wreck. Middle of February. I see F and the guy rolled the car. The girl gets a bed in the air. She's mostly fine. Beat up quite a bit but still coherent and talking. A state trooper is in her room with her. The dude is complaining but overall seems fine. She's asking me to see him and I tell her that they're stabilizing him and he's not going anywhere. She says what does that mean over and over again and I tell her that he's in a bed on a board. So he can't move. She's freaking out. I take the guy back to radiology. He's talking and joking. Things seem fine. We do the CT and his spine is broke. Not just broke. Severed. Guy is in for some serious surgery. Rehab. Might never walk again kinda stuff. The girl runs out of the room. Cop chases after her. They start fighting. A little 110 pounds girl is straight up squaring up with this big butt cop. Cop ends up tasering her in the middle of the air. Her dude is screaming because they told him about his spine. His girl is now chained to a bed. Turns out they were running drugs. High as eagle balls. Flipped the car and the dude probably never walked again. I always wonder though. High as eagle balls is now my go to. 
I know this will get buried and I'm not a surgeon but I was a paramedic. Got a call for a possible DB, dead body on the freeway. When we got there the whole freeway was closed with a big line of cars on the shoulder past the incident area and only one highway patrol car blocking traffic. We turned on the floodlights of the ambulance looking for anything but couldn't see any signs of an accident at all. Finally we noticed a large fleshy mass that upon inspection turned out to be a set of legs. We got flashlights out and headed down the freeway and it got worse. For about 100 yards pieces of human littered the road. A foot and a shoe. Teeth. Bone fragments and random human parts were everywhere. The largest part was the head and upper torso. We could only tell because there were more teeth sticking out of it. A motorcyclist had gone down after speeding and got run over by a semi truck. Then multiple cars ran his body over. This was the line of cars on the shoulder after the accident. There was also a nolly piece of spine all by itself for some reason. It was the craziest thing I ever saw in 5 years at that job. The truth is I was super tired and just glad I didn't have transport a patient. A friend of mine at the company called me and told me his GF was one of the people in that line who had ran his body over and she was terrified. I have many stories. One is a healthy 23 year old male comes into it with some chest pain. Normal vital signs. Never smoker. Normal chest x-ray. Pain started after eating something spicy. Tell him it's probably GERD. 5 minutes later he drops dead in his bed. Start CPR and get a pulse back. Stabilized. Get CT scan and has an aortic dissection. Dies again in CT scan and never makes it to the OR. The guy's major blood vessel basically just exploded. This happens to men in their 70s with a long smoking history and high blood pressure. This healthy 23 year old had absolutely zero risk factors for this. No evidence of Marfan's or Alo's Dandless for the med people reading this. Still makes no sense to me. I work in a cancer center and fairly regularly a patient with multiple cancers will get a biopsy of a lesion trying to figure out which cancer has metastasized and it instead turns out to be a totally different and unexpected cancer. This happened to a friend of mine. They were treating one lymphoma which was responding well as it's very treatable. Unfortunately it had must he simultaneously had a second type of lymphoma that would require a different treatment. But they found it too late. A very rare composite lymphoma. Patient came complaining of swelling in face. We suspected an abscess from a sick tooth. When they came we called 911 immediately because the swelling had almost completely cut off her airway and her O2 level was an 87. A sartawal. If you have a cavity or a broken tooth it is a big deal. A rotten tooth can absolutely kill you. Any abscess anywhere on the body can lead to blood poisoning or system wide infection. If it hurts and or stinks, take it to a doctor. Patient here. Went to the doctor after 3 weeks of soreness in my hip. Left the doctor's office in a wheelchair. Turns out my hip was fractured 80% through the femoral neck. Surgeon. I was repairing a self-inflicted gunshot wound with unknown history. I take face trauma, so it's not an unusual call. However, I couldn't make sense of the anatomy. He had shotgunned the roof of his mouth and corn flaked his palate and maxilla. But typically you can piece it back together. I soon came to the realization that it wasn't normal anatomy. He had a giant squamous cell carcinoma tumor infiltrating and eradicating his palate and maxilla. And he had blasted the tumor. Although he survived the gunshot, he would not survive this cancer. There are a few things worse than death. Amongst them is uncontrolled head and neck cancer. You lose the ability to taste eat, talk, smell, breathe through your mouth. Eventually emergent airway like tracheostomy or laryngectomy, with the exception of the taste and smell of your own purulence and fetid tumor, accompanied by perineural invasion of the trigeminal nerve leading to severe pain, and eventual dementia and death, all the while you're disfigured and fear inducing to others. He had just seeded it everywhere and removed any chance of palliative surgery and radiation. We did this man no favors by saving him. Also, get the Gardasil vaccination. Can prevent this. My father went to hospital with chest pains. They decided to do an angiogram. Die injected. He's lying under the machine and the surgeon suddenly changes his procedure. Are you okay? Feeling well. Any? Blackouts? No he replied. Just pain. A few more docs come in and are looking at the screen. They take him to another type of x-ray machine and again are looking in bemusement without explaining anything. 
You have a blood clot the size of a golf ball floating free in your heart. It's bouncing around the valves and we would expect you to have died very quickly from this. So they give him super strong clot busters, but were concerned it might shrink enough to get jammed. A lot of experts turned up, but all went well and he had a triple bypass a few months later. That was 30 years ago. He's 87 now and can walk with ease up at Ape Hills. I feel like any time you're having a medical procedure and see a doctor go quiet for a moment, stare intently at something, then call other doctors and like bro you got to see this crap, you're going to have an exciting day. Obligatory not a doctor, but I was a forensic technician assisting forensic pathologists at autopsy. One day, the chief and I were doing three routine narcotic OD autopsies, oftentimes with ODs. Our doctors would let us, the techs, do the whole evisceration to save time, so all the doc had to do was to examine the individual organs. So on the third dissident, she gave me the green light to start cutting. Once I had the chest plate removed, something didn't look quite right with his lungs. I called over the doc and she takes one look and goes I really hope you have your mask on as tight as it can possibly be. Her next words were terrifying. That's tuberculosis. We immediately had to inform the public health commission, kick everyone else out of the autopsy room, and convert our deco room, where we primarily did the exams of decomposed people and turn on the extra duty ventilation system and had to complete the exam with the full PAPR kit on. That was fun. There was that time when I just graduated and got registered as a senior house officer. Got placed in a community hospital about 45 minutes into the hills of the town. Nurse comes in after the two senior doctors have left for the day and calmly asks me to treat a patient. I ask for the PC. He had fallen out of a tree about 2 stroke 3 stories high, about 30 stroke 45 minutes ago and they brought him in because it was the closest place. Run into the tiny treatment room and there's my patient, in obvious distress, with multiple limb deformities. Ask the nurse for morphine only to be told it was out of stock. Ask the nurse to activate the trauma protocol, no one knows what that means. Call the nurse to ask her to call a senior doctor, no response from the doctors. Had to start a TLS on my own while shouting orders left and right. Had to use Diclofenac for pain control and after assessing at least an arm fracture and a leg fracture, with cervical tenderness, remembered that the nearest x-ray machine is over 45 minutes away in the town at the foot of the hills. Asked them to call an ambulance as an emergency to transport him for proper trauma care and asked for limb braces and C-collar. They didn't have any of them. That's when the senior doctor turned up and told one of the porters to make braces and the C collar from cardboard boxes that fluids came in. Got him stable and into the ambulance and out the door. It was a Friday afternoon and I ran to my car and drove 2 hours back home and had a small breakdown the entire way. Upside, right before I was moved to a new clinic, saw the patient again. Didn't remember him, but he remembered me. He had on a skull and neck and T-spine brace with healing limb fractures. He thanked me for saving his life before he left. What country was this please? Patient came into hospital with cystic fibrosis with end stage lung function. Had an infection but was there to get optimized for a lung transplant. Was transferred to IQ after hematosis. And then an IQ had massive hematosis and coded. Was a freaking shichow. A major artery in his lung had eroded and he was bleeding out into his airway quickly. At any normal hospital this already is the end. Fortunately he was at an academic tertiary medical center. They coded him for between 50 and 60 minutes before getting ROSC at the same time as massive infusion protocol and cannulating for ECMO. He had no chance at living without a transplant and even though it was already a long shot, they did the lung transplant while he was on ECMO and after he had been that way for about 10 days with basically no response to stimuli. After another couple weeks with the new lungs he started to respond and was taken off ECMO. Two months later he walked out of the hospital. Had no major deficits a year later at follow up. In my head he's like seeing a ghost or a zombie. I didn't understand half of what you said but I'm glad that SOB is still alive. Heck yay. Serious, doctors of Reddit, what is the rarest disease that you've encountered in your career? M. Cuda Saber. It's a rare form of scleroderma that makes your skin looks like you've been cut by a knife down the center of your face. This poor lady's mandible actually split in half. The rarest I've encountered is kid syndrome. 
Carotitis ichthyosis deafness. A 5 year old, very sweet, blind girl who literally had rough, thick, opaque skin on the surface of her eyes. Gorham's disease aka vanishing skull syndrome. A softball size area of my patient's skull disappeared and left behind a soft spot. She ended up with a plastic plate to protect her brain. Crazy disease. My best friend in high school had this. Part of how I got interested in medicine. Pseudosiasis or hysterical pregnancy. In a woman who was an inmate in the psych wing of a prison I rotated through. She thought she was pregnant with Jesus's triplets and had grown a massive pregnant looking belly. Was producing milk. Etc. I'm a veterinarian and dogs get a version of this. They get enlarged abdomen. Milk. And will sometimes mother. Carry around and cuddle with. Puppy like things like toys or rolled up socks. Holoquin ichthyosis. In med school there was a baby born with this. Basically their skin scales up and peels removing that very important barrier so kids born with this don't live long. She was just a couple months old and had not yet left the hospital since birth. I have a co-worker with ichthyosis. She has no fingerprints and her skin is scaly. She's also completely bald and very very pale. Most people don't know because she wears makeup, wig and gloves. But I taught a fingerprint class one time and she mentioned it and we did a little print thing with her and it was cool. Fibrid dysplasia ossificans progressiva. FOP. A disease that calcifies soft tissue and turns it into bone. When I was a medical student our group's cadaver had this disease. During dissections we sometimes would get poked by spiky pieces of bone in random areas of her body. Also had a spine that resembled a small turtle shell. I scrolled the thread looking for this as my sister has FOP. She's now 36 and a lot more is known about the disease than when she was a child. Lack of information in her youth led to several misdiagnoses and attempts to treat or operate actually cause. D. Flare ups which can quicken spread. We had a patient once. A young girl. Who was so sick that it broke our data analysis pipeline. When the code ingested a genome sequencing sample, it attempted to detect the chromosomal sex of the patient. It was using two metrics. The sample was considered female if it, 1, lacked Y chromosome, and, 2, was heterozygous on X chromosome, implying there were two copies of it. Otherwise the sample was considered male. This one sample registered as female on metric 1, no Y chromosome, but male on metric 2. Very little heterozygosity on X chromosome, which was not anticipated and resulted in our pipeline crashing. Upon investigation, it turned out that the parents of that poor girl were brother and sister to each other. As a result, she had very little genetic variation throughout her genome, not just X chromosome, and was consequently very sick, with a plethora of diseases typical for consanguineous births. Brazilian doc here. I live in a really poor part of an already poor country. When I was in my pediatric internship there was this baby with I herpetomegaly. Big liver. In my region. The first thing that you have to think about in this case is, is a disease called Kalar Azar. Also known as black fever or visceral leishmaniosis. It is an endemic disease which there is a parasite transmitted by a mosquito that can infect people with compromised immune system. Like people living with HIV. And kids. This parasite infects the bone marrow and simulates clinical signs of acute leukemia, like chronic fever, spontaneous bruises and bleeding. The patient developed anemia, leukopenia, low white blood cells, and low platelets. To compensate, some organs like liver and spleen take care of the bone marrow function to create new blood cells, and thus, get bigger. This disease is really common in my region, but really rare in other parts especially non-tropical countries like the US. Anyway, as I was saying, this baby girl, about one year old was admitted to investigate a hepatomegaly. But the catch was that she kept having those episodes of hypoactivity and sleepiness, and sometimes even faintings that would then get better after she was being breastfed. We then checked and saw that she was having lots of hypoglycemia episodes. Her lab was normal, and she had no other clinical signs that would remind of Kayla Azar. Besides the hepatomegaly, the patient had HERS disease, a genetic disorder that makes you produce less glycogen due to an enzyme defect. Never hear of it before meeting this patient, and I think I'll never will meet other one. Interestingly enough, 
In this same time, I had a patient that was admitted with leukopenia, anemia and low platelets that was also hospitalized to rule out Kalarazar, but he actually had Fanconi anemia, an also really rare genetic disease. In this one, the bone marrow slowly stops producing blood cells. Besides this, the patient also has kidney, facial, bones malformation and overall physical underdevelopment. Fetus in Fetu, 10 year old boy pregnant with his parasitic twin, PT. Maybe not the rarest, but saw a 4 5 year old patient with Lesh Nyhan syndrome on my PEDS rotation in med school. It's an X linked recessive disease that a quick Google search tells me affects about 1 in every 400,000 individuals. It's due to a mutation in an enzyme involved with DNA recycling. The thing all med students remember about it is for whatever reason these patients have a tendency to self-mutilate. My specific patient had to have a procedure to have all his teeth removed because he would terribly bite his arms unless he was physically restrained. I believe he had an older brother that went through the same ordeal. So sad, but definitely one of the more memorable cases from med school. I just read a journalist's essay about this syndrome. Terrifying stuff. Just knowing that a human body and brain can be so badly affected by a simple mutation. I thought it was much rarer than you've said, and learning the actual rarity is kinda throwing me for a loop. Walking corpse syndrome. Cotted delusion. 17 years in mental health and I've seen it once. The belief that some or all of you is dead. The guy was so certain he was dead he believed he was a zombie. I doctor here. Patient had bilateral acanthema bacaritis. Estimated that 0.0004% of contact lens wearers will be diagnosed with this condition in one eye. My patient had it in both. Acanthamoba keratitis is a rare parasitic infection of your cornea. Malignant hypothermia in my 11 year old patient. I was only in my second year of anesthesiology residency and I thought she was going to die. I had a salty old anesthesiologist as my attending and she calmly led the whole team through the treatment. My patient did great and her labs were all normal when I took her to the PEDS IQ. I couldn't sleep for two nights and still have haven't gotten over it. On my OB rotation during a residency, I helped deliver a baby who had spots all over. Further blood testing revealed the baby had developed leukemia while in the mother. Didn't know that was really possible prior to that day. Incredibly rare. I'm a pediatrician. I've seen two cases during my formation. It's pretty rare. My colleagues had a patient with catecholamine induced ventricular tachycardia. AKA every time this 13 year old exercised vigorously or even got too scared. The adrenaline would induce a deadly arrhythmia that needs to be shocked before long in order for him to survive. Seriously. Objective tinnitus I could lean close to the patient's ear and hear a ringing noise coming out. Central deafness patient had an anoxic brain injury and was essentially deaf even though there was nothing wrong with his ears. Dermatologist here. Some fun ones. Chromhidrosis, where sweat comes out in different colors. My patience was blue. Argyria, a permanent discoloration from silver overdose. Aquagenic urticaria, an allergy to contact with water. When I was in nursing school I took care of a woman with fibra dysplasia ossificans progressiva. Basically your muscles slowly calcify to bone, and every injury, even small ones speed up the process. She was pretty much wheelchair bound and needed 24 hour care. Neurologist here we see a lot of weird stuff. Autoimmune encephalitis. Brain on fire. Late onset familial neuromuscular diseases. Rare presentations of cancer. Or perineoplastic disorders. But one rare one sticks out for me. We had a patient who had come in with confusion and aphasia. Trouble speaking and understanding. We got more of a workup and saw small strokes all over. Bits in peculiar distributions. And not ones that would explain his findings. Along with it we saw micro bleeds all over superficial parts of his brain. Turns out he has what's called cerebral amyloid angiopathy related inflammation. It's an extremely rare inflammatory subtype of a stroke disorder that we still aren't totally sure what it is. It has similar amyloid deposition you see in Alzheimer's. Deposited around vessels, which makes them weak and prone to stroke and bleeding. It causes rapidly progressive dementia. I presented the case to our department. 
a large academic center, and most had never heard or seen it in their career. A couple of the stroke doctors were the only ones who knew about it and they'd never seen it. Really interesting case. There's a hereditary form of this disease where I live, Iceland, associated with cystatin C amyloid. Have never seen a case myself though. Most cases have been mapped so far due to genetic screening of families of affected individuals. Patient admitted for something unrelated starts deteriorating for no discernible reason. Has some mild generalized abdominal pain. But other than that no specific symptoms. However, he keeps worsening to the point where he's barely hemodynamically stable. On the abdominal contrast CT, there's fluid everywhere. Organs pushed against the abdominal wall. Just one enormous grey puddle from the top of his pelvis to his diaphragm. And then, at some point, there's a scribble of white pretty much smack dab in the middle of it all. In this context, signifying active bleeding, it was shaped like the world's smallest firework pop, and it was nowhere close any major vessel. Everyone was dumbfounded for a hot minute. It turned out to be a spontaneous, a traumatic rupture of the cystic artery. No surgeon in the building had ever seen one. Dude underwent embolization and made it out completely unscathed. Persistent genital arousal disorder. Having multiple orgasms a day, at any time, without any stimulation, becomes quite bothersome and uncomfortable, limits your daily activities and sleep is interrupted. Over time patients can become very hopeless. It is remarkable the dissonance between the name and the obvious joke, and the tremendous suffering these patients endure. I remember hearing about a few women with this on some prime time show like 60 minutes or dateline or something like that. I was a teenager so of course I thought it was hilarious for about 30 seconds until they started talking about how horrible it was and that it basically ruined their work lives, relationships, and everything else. It was pretty eye opening. Rarest disease that I've seen in my career thus far would have to be leprosy. It's something that one hears about in antiquity and something I read about in books but I never expected to actually encounter it in my career. As a Brazilian doctor, unfortunately, I've lost track of how many patients with leprosy I've seen. It is very interesting to me that this disease is listed here as rare. Geneticist here. I work in a pretty big hospital and we get hard to solve cases from all over the world. Some of the cases are so unique, there is literally no name yet the genetic disorder. So those would be the rarest. But for the sake of this thread, I will discuss something that is not the rarest, but is pretty rare, and one of the most interesting. Prader Willi or Angel Man Syndrome. These are two extremely different disorders that are both caused by the same exact genetic mutation. The only difference is if the mutation occurred on the paternal chromosome or the maternal chromosome. If it occurred on the maternal chromosome, you get Angelman syndrome which typically results in the child being overly happy, laughing all the time with light eyes and hair color, but also severe intellectual and physical disabilities. If the mutation occurred on the paternal chromosome you get Prader Willi syndrome, which results in the child having excessive hunger and can literally eat him herself to death but with only mild cognitive disability. These kids may go a very long time not getting diagnosed and will become quite obese. Bonus disorder if you're still here. Williams syndrome with this one the affected individual has an extremely charismatic, outgoing and fun cocktail party personality. They are cognitively impaired in most aspects except for speech and have very unique facial features that are described as elf-like. Genetic counselor here. I'm thrilled to see a geneticist chiming in, it's like this question was tailor made for the weird stuff in genetics. It's hard to talk about the rare disorders you diagnose when they literally don't have names. LOL. Just offhand, I'd have to say a case of mitochondrial DNA depletion syndrome. Less than 100 cases reported. Anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. 1 in 1.5 million. Psychotic symptoms, auditory or visual hallucinations, paranoia, delusions, due to an autoimmune disorder where your body produces antibodies against NMDA receptors in your brain. We've seen two this past year at our hospital. The real incidence of this could be higher than one in 1.5 meters but might not be tested for often enough. Once someone gets labeled a psych patient, consideration of medical etiologies often goes out the window. Alpha gal. Tick-borne disease that makes you allergic to red meat. Spongiform encephalopathy. Kruzfeldt-Jakob disease. 
Lone Star Tix transmitter switch always seemed ironic to me that a Texas themed parasite would stop you from eating red meat. I had a gentleman who came into the emergency room with extreme fatigue and was found to have very little blood in his body. I asked him what his medical conditions were, and he told me he had polycythemia vera, which is a condition where the body makes too much blood, the opposite. He told me he had been diagnosed years ago but had never needed treatment. At first I thought he was mistaken about his diagnosis, and then I was worried that his bone marrow might have gone into overdrive and eventually burned out. Eventually, we discovered that he did have polycythemia vera, but had been slowly bleeding from an obscure GI bleed, a tiny blood vessel in his small intestine that would come in and out and bleed small amounts into his stool. In essence his body was self-treating having too much blood by doing its own bloodletting. For years. One week he bled a bit too much and got out of whack and ended up in the hospital, which is where I met him. Crazy case. My aunt had this. Sadly, she eventually died of leukemia caused by the treatment for it. More unusually, her husband, brother-in-law and father-in-law all died from leukemia too. I presume a genetic link. Psychiatrist here. Antindar encephalitis, as seen on the movie Brain on Fire. About 2 cases per million per year, I've actually seen 2 cases 12 months apart. Oh snap I just had a patient with that, his symptoms were absolutely wild, then he recovered a bit and threw his headboard at me, I'm glad it's rare, as our neurologist looked at me like I was an idiot when I asked him what it was. OBGYN here, hum probably conjoined twins, thoracophagus, and a couple of cases of complete androgen and sensitivity syndrome. I'm a PAC, not MD do, I work in psychiatry, had a patient who came to me with worsened depression anxiety insomnia starting 4 months previous, in part related to recent increase in environmental stressors, started them on an antidepressant, they responded well, even started eating healthier, exercising on a regular basis, stopped smoking, they no show a follow up, we get an automatic refill request from the pharmacy a few weeks later call and get them rescheduled my patient makes it to that appointment sits down and says i have to be honest i don't remember you or why i was coming here i can't remember the last six months they ended up in the acutely ill fever confusion pain later they were diagnosed with aseptic meningitis which had injured the brain resulting in an amnesiac episode this patient had seen several specialists including neurology infectious disease immunology, and most had come to the conclusion the antidepressant had been the trigger for the meningitis. At the time there were two documented cases of a similar nature. The patient ended up becoming a case study. Upside they were no longer depressed or anxious. Downside, they were back to smoking and having a less healthy lifestyle. Rarity varies a lot by discipline. I'm in general surgery, so I see things like fernies and neck fask pretty regularly, but have never treated an ear infection in my whole career. That said, strangest presentation for me so far was a gentleman who had had an anti-reflux procedure on his stomach and esophagus, Nissen fund duplication with a hiatal hernia repair, then had a recurrence and got a ray, do which required a procedure to lengthen part of his stomach. Collis gastroplasty. After that procedure, you have a staple line in your stomach. His hiatal hernia recurred again, bringing his stomach back into his chest and he formed a connection between his stomach and the sac surrounding his heart. He presented to the emergency department dying because the gas and stomach contents could get into his pericardium, but not out, and his heart couldn't expand adequately to pump. Mad props to the ED doc who figured it out and saved his life before shipping him to me. OB nurse, we had a patient back when I first started who had two separate uteruses and cervixes and somehow, with the help of IVF, managed to get pregnant with one baby in each. The other case was a patient who was in delivering her fourth set of twins. She had had four pregnancies and was pregnant with twins each time. No IVF with this one. Her oldest set were four years old. Methemoglobinemia, Proteus syndrome, child syndrome. Also once sewed up a wound from woolly mammoth. Bite. Pallia grad student tripped and fell into a bone reconstruction table. Needed stitches. I diagnosed a patient with cancer of the parotid gland. It has an incidence of less than 1%. It went something like this. 
He came to me because he was having right jaw pain. I assessed him and nothing was really out of the ordinary. I thought he was having some TMJ because he had been dealing with some stress and he did have pain at the TM joint. A week later he came back with a Bell's palsy which is a temporary paralysis of one side of the face. This can be caused by inflammation or a viral infection. So I asked the appropriate questions and he had some upper respiratory symptoms the week before. But something was off. So I palpated his jaw again and moved more medially towards his cheek. And he said it was painful midway on his cheek, where his parotid gland was. There was something there, not a discernible mass, but something was off. That's when I ordered a CT scan, and it was confirmed. I got him to a head neck specialist along with getting him to a cancer specialist. He's currently 2 years out and although he's missing some of his face due to surgery, he's doing surprisingly well. And his spirits are great. My cousin had to have part of her jawbone removed and they never figured out what the mass was but it's exactly in the same area. This was about 10 years ago and she's recovered well and can eat normally and everything but her face has permanent asymmetry. Medical professionals of Reddit. What's the worst piece of advice your patients have gotten from Dr. Google? A 2 week old infant was admitted to my hospital with severe jaundice, which at birth is normal. But the mother, though, hadn't been breastfeeding the child because she read on the internet that breastfeeding is bad for babies. She decided the next best thing to do would be to feed the child a mixture of cornstarch and water because formula was too expensive. Baby lived, magically. People, though, man. I guess my question is how far down the rabbit hole you need to go before you find places saying breastfeeding is bad for babies. I've posted this before, but I had a patient with aggressive prostate cancer come in and tell me he hadn't been following up because he was drinking grape juice with baking soda, and that it was slowing the cancer growth. I told him in fact it was not, and the cancer was spreading. He said he disagreed, and would continue with the juice. Natural selection can be really aggressive sometimes. Herbal supplements cure Parkinson's. All that Merkula horse shit. Guy lived as a human statue for 10 years, communicating only by blinking. I came in, took one look, and dragged his butt to a neurologist. One month on the appropriate meds, he started walking, talking, and living semi-independently. It still pisses me off mightily. His mother, who was his sidekick and biggest supporter and instigator of this lunacy, felt he was betraying his spirit soul min thoughtfulness. She died of cancer after trying to treat it with herbs. So freaking prize. I had a patient rub garlic and onions into an infected abscess and soaked it in undiluted bleach several times a day. He couldn't understand why it was getting worse and where his chemical burn came from. What the frick? My good friend in college once showed up randomly at my dorm in the middle of the night, freaking out because she thought she was having a miscarriage. This was a surprise to me because I knew she'd been on her period recently, so I asked her when she found out she was pregnant. She gave me a blank stare and then said you have to be pregnant to have a miscarriage. I guess she just googled her symptoms, bleeding and abdominal pain, and settled on the first result without reading anything about it. The kicker was that she was really smart otherwise. I have no idea how she'd never heard of a miscarriage before. It says here that you might have network connectivity problems. I'm a pharmacist, and I used to work in a large retail pharmacy. An older couple came in to pick up a prescription for tamoxifen, which blocks the ability of estrogen to stimulate breast cancer cell growth. As I'm ringing them up, they ask which aisle can they find vitamin C in. I ask them some further questions which reveals that they read online that vitamin C could treat and prevent cancer, and they wanted an additional remedy so that the wife would not have to take her medication and would never get breast cancer again. It was kind of sad, actually. Same profession except in the hospital. It's amazing how many people honestly consider homeopathic medicine as an alternative. Had a friend of mine whose mom came down with cancer. They refused chemo citing it was toxic and that home remedies work better than these. It made me sad hearing about that. An effective method of birth control is abstaining when the woman is on her period. Because you can only get pregnant when the egg is being released. The second part is true. But the egg is released and available to fertilize during ovulation. Which is in the middle of the cycle not during menses. You should abstain during ovulation to avoid pregnancy. 
cinnamon to treat diabetes. Patient came in telling my attending that she was pretty sure it worked because she checked her blood glucose and it was high. She took the 1000 mg of cinnamon pill, and a little later her glucose went down. Now, if you check your blood glucose, the next step is to correct with insulin. So we asked if she just took the cinnamon by itself or with the insulin. She says with the insulin. Then don't you think maybe, just maybe, it was the insulin that lowered your glucose levels? But nope. Cinnamon must have done the trick. It's all natural with good ingredients. Actually cinnamon has been clinically proven to have an effect on blood sugar by lowering blood glucose levels. The study even says it could be helpful in the treatment of diabetes in addition to usual care. Basically, the cinnamon helps, but not tremendously. The studies were posted in Journal of the American Board of Family Medicine. Almost as bad as doctor. Google is doctor. Military doctor. Here's an ibuprofen for that broken leg. Oh you have kidney stones. Here's an extra strength ibuprofen. In 6th grade, I shattered both my kneecaps. The military hospital, though, kept telling me I had ACL tears. Because they didn't bother to actually look at the x-rays they took until I had my 6 week checkup. Didn't even spring for a wheelchair. I had to row myself around the house with a computer chair and a broom handle. On behalf of my sister, when I had my ileostomy bag, like a colostomy but for your small intestine, and by had, it was reversed in 2012 and my intestines are complete now, minus 3 feet, there was a blockage, a blockage is extremely painful as nothing can get out and you bloat very fast, you also vomit, you feel unbelievable stomach pains, it's like a trapped fart, the stoma is a tiny hole, I had a blockage and I was really upset and wanted to go to the air. My older sister is a nurse and had been visiting us at the time. My mom said the internet says to stick your finger in the stoma and just pull it out. We stared at her, horrified. Number. No one was putting any freaking fingers into a hole in my abdomen, into my intestines. My sister took me to the hospital herself. They gave me some drugs and I went under. They removed it. Turns out no one told me I couldn't have vegetables and fruits. I had carrots and strawberries the night before. They didn't go over very well. My mom is kind of a badass for wanting to do that for me. But holy crap no mom. I clogged my garbage disposal with carrot peels the other day so. Dang. I could write an essay on this. Any herbal supplement bullocks. For an example, when you first get out of school you have to put many hours in, specifically at health clinics. You have no idea how dumb people are. One guy said he saw online that taking a knife to his goiter and draining it and cleaning it would be a good idea. Drinking sugar water with salt to make Gatorade would help with electrolytes that would help his high blood pressure. I can go on. Suppose the worst was a man with dementia and was told that he had to spend 5000 for a prayer to cure him. They did it twice to him, because he forgot he gave the first time. Suppose the worst was a man with dementia and was told that he had to spend 5000 for a prayer to cure him. They did it twice to him, because he forgot he gave the first time. That's an impressive level of evil. Not a doctor, but a vet assistant. Please do not give your dog an enema at home. Especially not by using a turkey baster. It will end badly for your dog. Probably not great for the turkey baster, either. A couple had just had a baby, discussing contraception in postnatal period. They said they had been using the pill. They said they had been very compliant and they couldn't figure out how they'd gotten pregnant the first time. Guy pipes up and says yeah I take it one day and she takes it the next day. Total cluelessness. I suppose in their defense there's a certain logic to it. There's no logic to guessing how to take a prescription medicine. Read the label. It isn't hard. My boyfriend and I joke that his mother has an MD from the Dr. Oz School of Medicine. With a specialty in web and Yahoo answer searching. You think of a quack treatment. She'll tell you how it can cure my boyfriend's Lyme disease. She's all about detoxifying. Raspberry ketones. Lemon juice for curing cancer. High dose vitamin D. Colloidal silver. Salt caves. Vitamin infusion therapy. Himalayan salt lamps. Essential oils. Burning sage to ward off evil spirits. Epsom salts. Her latest craze is hyperbaric oxygen therapy to cleanse toxins and heal brain damage. Never mind that HBOT is not FDA approved for brain conditions. 
and has not been shown to be effective for be or brain damage or that toxins are the ill humors of today's medically uneducated masses. They told my boyfriend that the HBOT makes his skin absorb oxygen which is important because the skin is the largest organ, and oxygen is our most vital element because we're over 60% oxygen by weight. Pretty sure if cleansing the body with oxygen absorbed through the skin was a thing, we would have evolved without lungs or kidneys and livers. But what do I know? I'm only an engineer, not a doctor. In any case, my boyfriend has been feeling worse since starting HBOT. Wait till she finds out that antioxidants are working against oxygen. I work at a veterinary clinic and this woman said that she read online that if she fed her dog only raw carrots for a few days that it would scrape any parasites out of the dog's intestines. She brought in a fecal sample for testing and it was 90% carrot. Poor dog. My dog ate 16 radishes out of the neighbor's garden and had white poo for a few days this spring. Not a medic but I once met a man who swore he cured his own prostate cancer by drinking 4 liters of water a day laced with x drops of hydrogen peroxide. Here's the science. Oxygen helps repair cells. Water has oxygen because it's H2O. Hydrogen peroxide is H2O2 therefore twice the oxygen equals twice the cell repair. I'll have some H2O. 2. Not a dentist myself. But I work the lab at an office and occasionally assist when I have free time. The anti-fluoride people who come in every now and then can cause some pretty big headaches. Their teeth will be in crap shape, but they'll refuse even the simplest of treatments. You know like brushing their teeth with a better toothpaste, because they're scared we're trying to poison them. There was one lady who went on a tirade about only allowing natural products in her body and strictly no chemicals, and how fluoride is scientifically proven to be toxic. I mean, it is toxic, but this isn't all that. Even water can be freaking toxic. But then after trying explain and reason with her, she brought up her IQ and told the dentist she was smarter than smarter than smarter than smarter than smarter than smarter she got the red pen on her chart. Not a professional but a volunteer who happened to get a lot of patient contact here are some of my faves. Man who tore up his leg jumping a fence and decided to stitch it up with a sewing kit and rub it daily with lavender and honey. The honey attracted bugs while he slept. Girl who tried to cure a yeast infection with tampon soaked in yogurt and fruit juice. Not even cranberry. She insisted on lecturing me about the health benefits of shoving orange juice in an infected cooch. Woman with atherosclerosis who'd been eating multiple bars of dark chocolate a day because it was good for the heart. People are insane. <laughs> Clinical psychologist in US. We get tons of people self-diagnosing adult ADHD, particularly around college finals. Aside from secondary gain, stimulants can help with focus whether you have ADHD or not. Many people do not realize that anxiety and depression can seriously impact your ability to focus but do not want to accept these diagnoses because ADHD has less stigma. Not to say you can't have both ADHD and anxiety depression but typically you want to treat the mood issues first to see if this resolves the attentional difficulties. And the other side of this. People who took an online test and think they have bipolar disorder. The average specialty requires anywhere from 1 to 0 0 0 2 0 0 0 0 hours of training prior to being able to practice. And that's not counting subspecialization within a given specialty. The average idiot requires a superficial search without access to or understanding of medical research and a very small, very dangerous amount of information to believe they're better informed than their doctor. I'm all for patients being informed and making sound, rational decisions. But usually a small amount of information can result in an obstructive patient or family who prevents themselves or their loved one from receiving the best possible care. There are many good resources online to get yourself informed, but realize the docs are generally just trying to do their best. Example is the child of a patient who's a pre-med student, read about a disease on Wikipedia, and now thinks she knows the technical aspects of a Whipple in addition to post-op management. Ask us what we're doing and why, I'm all for it. But don't halt us at every dang step when we're just trying to make sure your parent has enough fluid in his vascular tree to pee normally. Also, but also don't vaccinate their children. Source, chief surgical resident at a large community hospital in a major city. Had a patient who changed from drinking 12 doctor peppers per day to 4 liters of apple juice per day to get better control of his diabetes. 
he did not get better control of his diabetes. Parents not getting their kids vaccinated, I just can't get my head around it, at all. One of my colleagues, who is a pediatrician, finally said enough is enough and any parents that wouldn't vaccinate their child would be discharged from the practice and would be given other physicians information because this particular physician would tell the as a dentist one you can fix cavities with coconut oil thanks to pinterest two fluoride gives you brain cancer 3. No x-rays for me please, I'm am strictly no radiation, though they have a suntan. Just let them know it's a gluten free x-ray machine. I had a 20 year old girl come to the ear because she thought she was having a stroke. She smelled smoke and looked it up online somewhere and decided it must be a stroke. I asked her a bit more about it and she actually saw smoke too, that is, she was near a fire. My cousin broke his arm and instead of going to the doctor, my grandma just put mud on it and said that'll put it back together. If you're ever an adult do this because the doctors will inject stuff and give you bad medicine she's Mexican and somewhat old, but come on. Yesterday someone was convinced they got their strep wound infection from the air. I didn't ask where that logic came from but I bet it had something to do with the internet. An old guy I met had earwax blocking his ear canal. Someone told him hydrogen peroxide would fix it, he used an eyedropper to put 10% H2O2 solution in his ear, he subsequently went deaf in that ear. Not a medical professional, but my dad has been ill for 15 years and my family and I have been his primary caregivers for the entirety, so we go to all of his doctor appointments, we've been through all of the stages of hoping something will slow down or reverse some effects of the illness, we've tried just about anything you can do yourself, any lifestyle change you can make to be healthier, any at home techniques to make things better, we've tried it all, we grew up eating all organic, tried being vegetarian, all herbal supplements, using all natural cleaning supplies, we had an all natural wood sauna built in our garage, anything hippie you could think of dad was kind of a hippie anyways. The funniest thing I hear people claim they need to do waste money on is to go to a sauna strictly for the purpose of sweating out toxins. I never say anything, and I laugh internally, that's not how it works, your body gets rid of toxins automatically every day and the process isn't expedited by sweating profusely, sweating can be very good for your skin, you can sweat out dirt makeup oils bacteria that were been sitting in your pores, but it's not flushing out toxins from inside your body, if no one could automatically get rid of toxins without having to sweat profusely, everyone would be dead. You probably can't sweat out the toxins, but I'll be damned if it doesn't feel like it when you're in one with a giant hangover. Not me but my SO is a PA and she told me of a diabetic patient had come in because his blood sugar was 400 or 500, unknown unit of measurement, and he said he stopped taking insulin because he saw online he could take cinnamon instead. I'm a diabetes educator in training and oddly enough have seen this happen more than once. Many people think insulin is a sign of failure or the devil. I have to constantly remind people that insulin is not a bad thing. In fact will make you better. Sigh. Not a medical professional. Just have relatives who try to push doctor. Google treatments onto me. I've been told that honey. Salt and baking soda for 3 weeks cures epileptic seizures. Also. From the same person. That I need to cleanse toxins by eating nothing but cabbage and drink aloe vera. Those can also help cure seizures and I shouldn't take my prescribed ED medications because they are poison. My mother is, wearing out her welcome on earth. A friend of mine tried curing a UT with acupuncture. It didn't work and she ended up going to a doctor and absolutely flipping out about having to take an antibiotic. Like, she had trouble sleeping she was so afraid of it being toxic. Not a medical professional. But goddamn the crap women tell other women to do to avoid going to the doctor for easily treatable problems like yeast infections and UTs are horrendous. Putting yogurt soaked tampon up your vag is my favorite one. You're supposed to eat the yogurt, not give it to the fungus to eat and grow more. My other favorite is douching with apple cider vinegar. This is what imbalances the pH of your vagina allowing the yeast to flourish rather than die. Take some freaking meds, people. 
3 month old baby was not eating as much as she normally does. Crap was a funny color. Has been spitting up a lot. She breathes really fast. Her heart rate is very fast. Mother somehow got some kind of organ failure. Took her to the local urgent care ED combo that we have. Gave baby fluids for possible dehydration. Did all kinds of tests. Everything negative. Baby was eating fine at ED. Didn't spit up. Poop was poop. Vitals were within normal limits. Argued with us saying that it was too fast. Her reasoning was she googled normal pulse and resps for adults. Thinking they were supposed to be the same as babies. Got discharged we took her home. Back in the morning for the same crap. Wants to be taken to our main hospital an hour away because it has a peds floor. Same crap get discharged taken back home. Calls 911 an hour after being taken home. For the same freaking problem. Okay well where do you want to go? Children hospital or filler. No that is too far. We can either take you to Virtua or Cooper. I want to go to Chop Mom Chop is an hour away. We can't bypass two hospitals to take you out of state. To refusal. Goes to the urgent care ED. Gets admitted. Demands for Chop to come and pick up her child from that ED. Decided to not get involved. And just stay in my little closet. She disappeared. Wherever she went must have not worked. Because she was in the ED again 3 days later for the same crap again. TL. DR. Had a woman call two hospitals and all their staff the most incompetent people on the planet. Because who on the world would lie on the internet. Physiotherapist here. We get plenty of patients coming in after the stuff they tried themselves has ended up making them worse. I'll frequently get patients in complaining of back pain. Who have been doing sit ups to try and relieve it. Most of these people have discogenic pain posterior derangements. And make themselves a whole lot worse with sit ups. I'll also get patients who I've given a specific exercise program to go home. Google more. And do those as well. For instance. Had a post-op ACL patient go home and start doing plyometric exercises. Because he'd seen on Google that that was what you were supposed to do. Despite the fact that I'd spent the last hour talking him through the rehab progression. Healing times etc. And had been very clear that he wouldn't be able to do that kind of stuff for at least another few months. He ruptured the graft. We'll get plenty of people who swear by absurd diets or homeopathic remedies. And are sure they these things are doing more for their injuries than myself or their doctor are. Some of the more frustrating patients are the ones who've self-diagnosed. And then come in demanding a specific treatment. Most of the time, their diagnosis is wrong. As they've just read a couple of symptoms. Usually along the lines of pain around this area and occurs most frequently within. Insert very broad population group. And they'll refuse to accept that it might be something else. They're also the most likely to demand alternative, inappropriate, as in, not appropriate for their injury, or just useless treatments. Plenty of people coming and demanding manipulations when not appropriate, demanding therapeutic ultrasound when it's a load of crap, or demanding incredibly obscure or weird treatments. I have it the other way round. Dr. Google says this particular pill possibly has permanent side effects. Doc laughs it off tells me to keep going. Now I suffer from those side effects. I had a patient require emergent liver transplant because of liver failure caused by herbal supplements. I'm guessing the internet told her that herbal supplements were natural and therefore safe and better for her. So scary. I think I mentioned it before. But I used to belong to a web forum for spinal cord injuries. And once upon a time there was a post there all about how we could heal ourselves if we just ate more fish. Because fish will drive the toxins out of our bodies. Yeah, my spine isn't freaking broken. It's those dang toxins. But, but mercury. PT had a bad ulcer on her eye. And decided to treat it by using breast milk. She was using breast milk eye drops on her dang eye. We saw her too late. And she went blind in that eye. Not doctor. Google but as a med student on my GI rotation we saw a patient whose boyfriend convinced her that her hep C medications were more dangerous than actually having hep C. So she flushed them. 6 months of pills to the tune of over 70k. She was back because she realized she needed them and wanted a new prescription. Yeah, good luck with that. My mother was doing a rotation at a rural health clinic in Texas during school. Whenever she would see sexually active women, she would verify they were practicing safe sex. 
One woman confirmed she was very diligent about using a jelly. My mother asked what kind, and she replied with Smucker's grape. Pregnancy and a yeast infection. Here is a reverse of this. I had a doctor years ago decide that a panic attack was being caused by a bad diet after she sat there googling the ingredients of my dinner the night before. Not a medical professional, but I have met someone who read on the internet that a mixture of various blended household plastics, like water bottles or trays, would help you have more stamina when exercising. I really hope they didn't try it, and have no idea why they believed it or what connection they made with plastics to stamina, or anything for that matter, but I guess I'll never know. Doctors of Reddit, what is the most heart-wrenching diagnosis you've ever had to give? Maybe a bit late, but a friend of mine had a case where this couple who were trying for about 5 years to have babies, fertility problems, with a ton of money spent, discovered that their 4 months old baby had cancer and would probably won't finish his year. Apparently, the father had a mental breakdown at the spot and had to be hospitalized. Freaking heck. This might be the worst of the thread. I hope at some point they can move on and maybe adopt or have a surrogate. They seem to have a lot of love to give a child. Not a doc but used to teach lunchtime EFL classes at a hospital and the heart surgeon comes in with a really long face. He had one kid come in who had no real symptoms but the valves into his heart were narrowing so without surgery he was doomed in the long term. So they decided to cut out one small valve and one big valve and transplant the big valve to where the small valve had been removed and put an artificial valve where the big valve had been at least that was the gist of it. Long time ago and I don't know medical terminology at all. The transplant didn't take and the kid died. He'd just come in from an hour of the parents screaming at him for killing their kid. They were taking it especially badly since the kid wasn't displaying any symptoms before the operation. And this guy was really good at his job. He had awards for open heart surgery on premiers and did a successful heart and two lung transplant of a woman who had lung cancer spread of her heart and but everyone has things go wrong. Just know I could never do a job where the off days are people die. Really didn't know what to say to the guy. I have a patient I've seen for 4 years. Really nice guy. Couple of minor health issues. His wife has been going through treatments for breast cancer, then brain cancer, since I've met him and is finally doing well. He came in with unintentional weight loss about 2 months ago, though noted that he actually felt pretty good overall. He had lost about 20 pounds in 2 months without trying. He thought maybe his diabetes was just a bit out of control as this is how his diabetes had presented initially. We did a workup that took a while and bottom line is he ended up finding that he has pancreatic cancer. Had to bring him and his wife in and explain that while she was doing much better, he has likely a very short time to live. You're not supposed to get close to patients or necessarily get attached. But this one was hard to do. When I saw the results of his CT scan initially I just felt dread and sadness. I just dreaded having to tell them the news. I felt horrible for them. I just wanted to be able to put it off forever. But obviously it had to be done. That the reason the little girl was not waking up was because mother's boyfriend had beaten her to the point she had a subdural hemorrhage. Cousin's boyfriend beat her too yo to death for crying. It's always freaking painful when that happens to a kid. Not a doctor, but a nurse. I had a patient who was 31. She was admitted with weight loss, dehydration, intractable nausea, fatigue, and abdominal pain. Her mother had just passed 3 months prior to her admission due to colon cancer. She was diagnosed with uterine cancer. Though I didn't give her the initial diagnosis, as that is the doctor's role, I was the one present with the family trying to answer questions about the options and what to expect. She was initially a hopeful candidate for surgical removal of the tumor, and it was tough trying to help her cope with never being able to have children. Her boyfriend couldn't handle the situation and broke off the relationship. I have no idea what their relationship was like or how long they had been dating. So I don't judge him. It was just so hard to watch her grappling with the loss of her mother, the loss of hope for having a baby, then feeling abandoned by her so. It was then discovered the cancer was stage 4, meaning it had spread, and there was no surgical option. They tried chemotherapy, but this was an aggressive and rapidly progressing disease. I had to explain to the family how her sudden dementia and confusion was caused by the metastasizing tumors reaching her brain. She was in the hospital for about 4 months before she passed. Jesus.
I'm 31. Frick, life is just cruel and pointless sometimes. My dad is an ophthalmologist, eye surgeon. He always goes back to the same experience. Retinoblastoma is a cancer that mostly affects children. You can detect it if the usual red eye in flash photos is white in one, or both, eyes. It can be hereditary. Treatment can be attempted, but if not caught early enough, the only way to try to save the patient is to enucleate, remove, the eye. When he was a resident, there was a 5 year old girl in the hospital. She'd had her left eye enucleated a few weeks prior. In a follow up scan, they found tumors in her right eye as well, and had determined it needed to be enucleated as well. She came out of that surgery with her head bandage up. Her parents were by her bedside when the nurse removed the bandages. Once they were off, this 5 year old girl sat up, and just said, Daddy, I can't see you. This is the most heartbreaking post I've read today. Had to be on the team that told someone that the reason they can't get pregnant is because of a tumor on the top of her uterus. Turned out to be cancer, and that not only would she be a mother, it had spread and she had 9-12 months at best. That is heartbreaking. Holy heck, just imagine receiving that prognosis when just the day before your concern was why you're not able to be pregnant. Now, you have a year to live, I honestly don't know what I would do with myself. I'm sitting here moping about work when there are people out there hearing this kinda news. I grew up in the US, but went to med school in India. A few years ago, during my pediatric rotation of internship, I had an 11 year old patient with worsening seizures and other neurological symptoms. He was from a rural village and had slipped through cracks of the vaccination program. And as it turned out, he had a history of measles as an infant. We diagnosed him with subacute sclerosing penencephalitis, a progressive and fatal complication of measles with an onset years after the initial infection. It was heartbreaking trying explain to the parents that their child had months to a year left and that the cause was something that happened almost a decade ago. That's awful. I work in nursing and my colleague dealt with a lad in A&E. He was young, just broke up with his girlfriend and took an overdose. He was unconscious but the damage was done. All his organs were failing and there was no chance of getting matching transplants. Not that he would survive an attempt to replace all his vitals in one go. He eventually came round, not sure if naturally or woken from an induced coma. I forget, he realized what he had done. Thanked the nurses for saving his life and chalked it up as a close call and now realized he wanted to live. But the doctor had to tell him he was going to die in a few hours. They could make him comfortable to say his goodbyes but there was nothing else they could do to actually save him. He spent the rest of the night with his family and died a few hours later. Now I've seen some crap, but that would probably have ended my career. A close friend is a doctor, and I know his toughest news to pass was to the parents of a 17 year old boy. He wanted off of life support. He had been paralyzed in a motorcycle accident, and could only communicate through yes or no answers. The boy was unable to tell his parents, and hoped that his doctor would understand and break it to them. After making sure that the patient had thought it through, he did as he asked, and ultimately the boy got his wish. Neuropsychologist at a hospital, I get the title doctor from having PhD, if that matters. The most emotional conversation I've ever had to have with any patient was with a lovely elderly couple and their daughter. The couple met in school, and had been together ever since, had one child, and were both retired comfortably. They were living in a granny flat behind the daughter's house, but were still very independent. They had both been coming in for neurological exams, because they had been experiencing some memory loss, and we were keeping track of their progress with various tests. Long story short, I had to tell this couple and their daughter that they were both exhibiting the early signs of dementia and that it was likely going to get worse with time. Thankfully they had periods of lucidity still, and so we were able to set up some management plans for them, but the daughter looked like we had just ripped her whole world away. I've never seen someone in so much pain be so strong. She was positive and supportive and reassuring them, but I could see that she just wanted to break down right there. She would come back every few months for counseling. We run a separate clinic too, and I kept seeing her after the couple passed away, and she is doing much better. From having a parent with dementia myself, I could only imagine the pain of having both parents succumb at about the same time. 
I didn't tell the diagnosis to the patient, but diagnosed it yesterday on his CT scan, and it has been weighing heavily on my mind. Patient with stage IV colon cancer, his colon perforated, and infection from the bacteria in his colon spread to his testicle, and there was likely also infection around his aorta. They took out the colon and the testicle. Amazingly, he was discharged from the hospital, came back a few days ago, repeat CT showed the infection caused a huge aneurysm, dilation of his aorta, and it is leaking blood. So basically it is going to rupture and he will die almost instantly. Or, maybe it slowly leaks out and death happens more insidiously. I can't imagine being told you have a ticking time bomb inside of you and may have hours, days, or maybe weeks. Not a doctor, I'm an ophthalmic assistant. Recently, we had a woman, in her late 60s, referred to our eye clinic from the emergency room. Very nice lady, pleasant. Woman states she had dry eye condition and her dry eye has made her vision grey and blurry the last few weeks. Has been increasing her artificial tear use, but she woke up with all black vision in one eye. As she's telling me this, I know there's no way dry eye causes these symptoms. She's lucid, just uneducated, I guess, because she thinks she needs better artificial tears. She faithfully gets her eyes checked every year by her daughter who's an optometrist. Diagnosis, end stage glaucoma, permanently blind in one eye. The other eye has permanent peripheral vision loss. The cupping of her optic nerve should have been an indicator of glaucoma years ago. Her eye pressure on the now blind eye was above 60. Normal pressure is below 25. Could have been diagnosed and treated and likely never hit this point. People don't feel glaucoma to the patient. This seems sudden, but it's a process which takes time usually several years for her type glaucoma. As the doctor was explaining the reason for vision loss, it was really sad to see this sweet woman in denial, disbelieving, and planning on a second opinion with her optometrist daughter. Pretty sure she was still just hoping to get better artificial tears to clear the black vision. Lady's whole life is going to change. She won't pass a DMV vision test, lost her depth perception, is now considered legally blind. I can't imagine the guilt the daughter will have for not catching the condition. I'm trying to figure out why not. Maybe they only were checking for glasses prescription every year, and not dilating to look at eye health? Anyway, it makes me very sad to think of them at future family events. I can't choose. 1. You have penile cancer. If we amputate it will be virtually curative. Or you die in 2-3 years. 2. You have complex regional pain syndrome. Type 1. Cold variant. You will likely lose the use of your right arm as it withers away. Maybe it will spread to your left also. All while experiencing pain worse than burning to death. Probably until you die. Or my fiance has CRPS and I just got very very sad. Had a lady follow up with me in the office after being discharged from a different hospital system without a diagnosis as to why she was jaundiced. I knew something bad was brewing so I ordered a stat MRI of her liver and found a cholangiocarcinoma, tumor of the bile ducts, in a location which was incurable. I had her back in the office within 48 hours and told her the news as gently as I could. She just said this must be really hard for you. I just lost it and started crying immediately. I couldn't believe she though of me in that moment. We hugged and cried for a while and she was very appreciative. Not a doctor but I can tell you my doctor's moment. I had an appointment that she was a little late to. Came in, not herself. She said that her colleague in the office had just given a cervical cancer diagnosis to the youngest person ever diagnosed in the practice. I just lost my cousin after a battle with cervical cancer. She was mid-twenties. Fought so hard. Had a full hysterectomy. Knew they'd never have children. Dealt with that blow. Lost a limb when the cancer spread. Eventually couldn't fight anymore. We both worked very hard to keep it together and get that prescription for my headache medicine filled. As though either of us cared. Reminds me of a when doctor. Green has his brain tumor and some little girl is whining. He says something like I have an inoperable brain tumor. I win. Doctor now. This happened when I was a neurosurgery extern in LA. Was in surgery and got paged from our other hospital that a kid, 19 years old, was found unconscious in the hospital hallway and was initially brought in for dehydration and a high fever. 
We couldn't leave in the middle of surgery and had him transported to our hospital. As soon as he got there, did all the scans and exams and realized he had bled everywhere in his brain and was now brain dead. Bacterial meningitis was the final diagnosis and had to tell the family. I spoke Spanish. Attending did not. Tried explaining to them that there was nothing we could do from this point forward. Family didn't understand and finally asked point blank is he going to die and I responded yes and they all started screaming. Worst position to be in when family friends think you can do something to help their loved one. And despite all the training sometimes it's impossible. It's a horrible feeling because you wish you could do something. I still think about that kid. Not a doc but I was with a friend of mine when she had a terrible diagnosis. At 27 she was diagnosed with brain cancer and only had a couple months to live. It was terrible enough but I felt devastated to hear that something so terrible could happen to her. She was one of the most positive and hardworking girls I knew. At 18 she took in her 4 siblings and became their legal guardian. She gave up going to a good school for college to work multiple jobs and crazy hours to provide for her family and essentially raise the two younger children. The youngest was 4 at the time. She gave them a great childhood and guided them and let them have as normal of a childhood as they could. She always tried to make sure they had money so the kids could join clubs, play sports whatever and would often go hungry for days and none of these kids knew the true extent of what she did for them. The eldest kid, 16 stroke 17 at the start, was terrible. He was young who was still grieving the loss of two parents so he readily took all his anger out on her and was great at wasting money and just adding stress. But she was so patient and a better parent than I could have ever been and got through to him. He's a good young man now, but it was terrible knowing what her family and those kids would have to go through after everything they had gotten through. The last couple years before the diagnosis had been good. Finances weren't an issue and she was going to night school and they were happy. Not the doctor but the patient. A number of years ago I had a lump in my neck. My family doctor thought it was a blocked lymph node following that cold or flu I'd had a few weeks earlier. My doctor leaves the city, and I'm without a family doctor. Fast forward one, one stroke two years, and I get a GP again. One of the first things she does is refer me to a surgeon about this. It's visible without touching at this point. Doesn't take long to get an appointment, and when I tell a friend that works at the hospital, she informs me he is an oncologist, and one of the best. Doctor is wonderful, explains he suspects non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and that this particular type of cancer has a good survival rate, and orders a biopsy, done the very next day. I'm aware this has been there a long time at this point. Three anxious weeks later, I have the first act on a Monday morning. Doctor comes in apologizing for not having reviewed my results in advance and opens my file. Let's out this huge sigh and puts his head down on his folded arms on top of my folder. Looks up and I can see the tears glistening in his eyes. And my heart sinks through the bottom of chair. I've trying so hard not to worry in advance. You don't have cancer. I was so sure you had cancer. I never get to tell anyone good news. You just made my day. Gets up and hugs me. Proceeds to refer me to ear, nose and throat for surgical removal of a brachial cyst. So thank you all you doctors that deliver bad news day in and day out with compassion. I really thought that ending was going somewhere else. Glad it didn't. I work in physical therapy. We had a semi driver who had a spinal cord injury from a driving accident. His parents disowned him because he was gay and wouldn't help with his medical bills or let him stay at their house. He had lived out of his truck and was essentially homeless. We tried to keep him approved to stay in the hospital as long as possible, but eventually we had to tell him we couldn't keep him there anymore and it broke everyone's heart. And because of his injuries none of the homeless shelters could take him because they didn't have the facilities to accommodate him. I moved to a different unit shortly after so I never found out what happened to him. Not a doctor, but a nurse. Elderly woman brought in by daughter to a for possible stroke. Showed up to my floor a few hours later, alone, completely immobile and constantly sleeping, unable to speak. Palliative care nurse spoke to daughter over phone, gently trying to explain that since the doctors had determined her mother to be terminal, it would be best to make her a DNR. Do not resuscitate, no CPR breathing tube BTC. If she were to go into cardiac or respiratory arrest, daughter refused to listen, saying that her mother was a fighter. 
didn't seem to understand that DNR doesn't mean we stop treating her with meds or antibiotics or oxygen. But it does mean that we won't break her ribs while she can feel every second of it or ram a tube down her throat so it feels like she's suffocating even though it's breathing mechanically for her. I cared for that poor lady 3 days straight. Her only visitors were her pastor and his wife. And she finally coded the third night. Had to be resuscitated 4 times throughout the shift with the breaking of bones and whole bit before they finally let her be at peace. The daughter was called when she first started going downhill. She still hadn't come by the time I came in for day shift. Everyone should have a medical plan if you want CPR, ventilator, or feeding tube. And if you want them for the rest of your life or only a short term trial period to see if you're going to recover. If you don't deal with an unpleasant subject while you have the mental and physical fortitude. Cross your fingers that you have a healthcare team that can choose the right words to say to your grieving family stuck making those decisions for you. I had a patient whose newborn baby wasn't expected to live. The baby's condition was a surprise to the mother and her family. I got to sit in while the doctor tried to explain that the baby was doing very poorly. The mom and family remained quite optimistic. Fast forward to a few hours later and the doctor returned to tell the patient, in a shared room, that her baby was doing very poorly and wasn't expected to make it. Doctor was frustrated that the, very young, mother wasn't reacting the way she wanted. Told me that she was at the end of her bag of tricks and was upset that mom wasn't responding to her sudden news. Granted this poor girl just gave birth to a very medically unstable baby that she had no forewarning about. I ended up having to try to talk mom into seeing her baby, knowing basically nothing other than the prognosis was very poor. It was horrible all around. The way the doctor approached the situation, the way mom was too young and optimistic. I'll see him later. Trying to remain as neutral as possible while attending to 4 other mom baby pairs that were happy as can be. I believe the baby ended up passing in the next couple days. It was. Incredibly sad. While I was on Euro consults, a 23 year old girl came in complaining of a headache for 6 months. At first I thought she was exaggerating. Possibly looking for painkillers. Then I saw she'd actually been to an outpatient neurologist who tried every med under the sun for presumed migraines, and had gotten a CT scan and MRI without contrast, both unrevealing. The pain became unbearable so the girl came to the hospital and was admitted for further workup. Right after she is admitted, per our recommendation, she gets an MRI with contrast, which shows leptomeningeal carcinomatosis, cancer metastases all over the matter covering her brain. I had gone home for the day by the time the result was read, I was just on consult service, but the attending from the primary medical team sat down with the girl around 7pm that night and explained she had cancer, and they didn't know where it was coming from yet. He explained the most likely places were either her stomach or her uterus. He asked if she wanted help in telling her family, who had also gone home to rest for the evening after being at bedside all day. But the patient decided to have tests done to find where the primary cancer was first so she would have a better idea of what the plan was moving forward when she told her family. The next day, I get to the hospital around 9am. Consult service hours are nice. I pull up my patient list, and she's listed as not being in the hospital anymore. I thought maybe she signed out against medical advice. I open her chart to find out that around 6.30 that morning, the patient became altered and then quickly unresponsive. Code was called, CPR started, the whole works, her family shows up at around 7.15am to see a team of doctors doing chest compressions, the team hadn't even had time to inform them of the code yet, because it all happened so fast, remember, these people had no idea the girl had cancer or even anything seriously wrong with her, other than her headache, they were devastated and initially insisted that everything be done to keep her alive. But after witnessing a few rounds of CPR, they asked for the priest to come and give her her last rites, and she passed away. I cried so hard I couldn't see patients for most of the day. This poor young girl, all of a sudden just gone, and her poor family who had no idea it was coming. She was trying to protect them and give them hope. Such a mature decision for someone her age, but they ended up in pain anyway. So tragic. I remember her often as an example of how fragile life is. Pretty dark thread so I'm here to add some funnies. Not me but my dad. Worked at Jackson Memorial. Had a very very obese woman come in after falling and hitting her head. 
went to run a CT or CAT scan, not sure which, and she was too fat to fit into it. My dad was the lucky man who had to tell this woman they were taking her to the metro zoo where they had scanners meant for hippos that would fit her. Not a doctor, med student who have just completed my ophthalmology rotation. A 38 year old male patient came in, with a loss of vision of his left eye and peripheral vision on his right eye. He was confident that the doctors will fix his eyes, since this was among the best ophthalmology centers in the country. When the doctor explained that the damage was permanent and surgery was the only option to save whatever left of his right eye, he remained calm but we could clearly see that he was trying to hold back tears. The doctor, despite of her 20 years of experience with glaucoma, told me that it would never get easier having to explain to a patient about their vision loss, especially with the younger ones, whose their entire world was going to fall off after the diagnosis after the di I'm not a doctor but I'm the youngest son in a family of four, the only college graduate and I work in hospital administration, so to my parents, I'm a doctor, I had to explain to my mother, my father, and my older siblings that mom had pancreatic cancer. I had to explain to my mom when she woke up that her attempted surgery to remove the tumor, that the surgery failed. I had to watch as the massive tumor caused her unbearable pain. Explain to her that her pain was not going to stop. That she was being put on high dose delorded. Explain to the doctors that it wasn't helping, that she was hallucinating. That she was screaming and asking to die all day every day. I had to beg a major cancer hospital for help. And they helped us. They stopped her pain. They got her eating again. They shrunk her tumor and gave her time. Then when everything was going good, I had to explain to her and my family that she had sudden kidney failure and that she was going to need to go into hospice. She did pass away about a year after her diagnosis. But she never was in pain again and she was able to say all her goodbyes. Probably the worst and best times of my life. Hard, but the good times we had at the end is all I can remember now. Fair few. Worked in quite a few specialities. In the air. Uh, strokes and heart attacks. Psychiatry. Diagnosing a young teenager with schizophrenia. In neurology. Dementia. Breast cancer in general surgery. On the wards on call as a junior. Death. All difficult in their own ways. Anything related to the brain hits me hard though, because of its effect on personality and just being. Young people being diagnosed with schizophrenia is one of the most horrible things. It's truly heartbreaking, and it's always the ones with the most potential. I had a patient come in talking about how they were recently in remission from lung cancer 6 months ago had just finished treatments and was ecstatic about their oncologist's visit a week ago that said everything was normal. Patient came to the ED with dizziness and assumed it was just dehydration. My neuro exam showed some dysmetria, poor coordination, so I can scan them. Sure enough, brain cancer, they were crushed. I think, out of all the bad news I've given. The times I have had to tell a family that their loved one has had a devastating brain injury and is brain dead have probably been the worst. That or when I am taking a patient to surgery who we all know is going to die, and I have to tell the family that the patient is a really high risk of dying in the or wheeling them out of the room and knowing that their family may never see them alive again feels pretty bad. Family member here. When my mother was declared brain dead after an asthma attack it was the hardest thing I had to hear. My family chose to take her off of life support and donate her organs. I remember the doctor, she looked young and could not have been doing it for long. Tell my dad we were doing the right thing. I had a 21 year old come in right around new years a few years ago. His serious girlfriend made him come in because he had lost a little bit of weight and was feeling tired. He told me that he works about 60 70 hours a week and loved his job, but that he blamed his job for the fatigue. He wasn't sleeping well and complained of headaches nearly every day. This had been going on for the last 3 weeks. So I do a once over and immediately notice his spleen is about 3 times too big. When I asked him if he had noticed this, he mentioned that he had but didn't stop to think about it. I grab an US and some blood work. Ultrasound shows a 17 cm spleen. Normal is 11 cm. And at this point I'm praying the kid has mono and is just having a major reaction. His white blood cell count came back at 680. Normal is 410. 
We rushed him to see an oncologist who promptly put him in the best hospital for cancer in our area. I later heard the oncologist put all her patients on hold for 3-4 hours while she answered all his questions and pulled some strings to get him the best care. I received a letter from his parents a month later. He was diagnosed with acute myelogenous leukemia and doing well. I'll never forget that kid. Dang. And to think, his girlfriend made him come in. This could have gotten worse. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. Bye for now.